It is Monday this time. This time it is Monday. Woohoo! Hey, we're powering speed. 908-751-0211 if you got the balls to call. And good old like us on the good old uh, Facebook iTunes. But this one you're really going to want to share because, boy, we have a good special guest calling in. Yeah, it's a little late to share it now. Well, <laughs> I mean, if they were going to listen live. But no, it was pretty heavily shared, so that's pretty good. And uh, uh, I uh, Oh, they can share it again. Yeah, no, I mean, it definitely. You tell them, Tad. Yeah, you Damn, tell them. Share it. Share it. It, uh, no, this should be, this should be a great show. I mean, I'll, well, we'll talk about that as it gets closer. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What? Kenny. Mr. Duttweiler. Yeah. He'll Ooh, be yeah. good. Be really good. He's a really cool guy. I know He's, you, I know you talked to him a bunch. You know, I talked to him a bunch. I talked to him again today. He's just a cool guy. Well, let's talk about it now. I mean, might as well. I mean. We're not. We're not. <laughs> Um, I, I talked to him for probably a half hour, yeah, maybe 40 minutes. Really? Yep. And I, it was one of those things that I had to stop talking to him because yep. we were doing everything that we're going to talk show. about here. Yep. It's it, this is going to be really good. And I, you know, and I want, I, I would prefer it to be technical, you, you know what I mean? But he's got a lot of he's just got stories. conventional stories that are, that are from the entertainment side. Yeah. And probably be really cool. For everybody to, to hear. <clears throat> now, one thing I didn't I didn't really clarify with him um, was callers. Like, if he wants to take a, a caller question, uh, I, I would tell people, try to put it in Mixler. And I know we always say, you know, stop looking at it, but we'll look at it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, well, you're never talking, Todd. You can sit there. You can look at it. You look at it anyway. Yeah. Maybe. But really excellent person to talk to. So, and, and he's got some life experience, man. Oh, oh yeah. You, this is, this is one of the people that you could hang out with him for a year and absorb like 5% of what he knows. If you're lucky, the, there's just no replacing that, the, the, having the experiences. I mean, like you were talking about the hill climbs and all the other stuff. There's just so much stuff there. And the land speed thing, that's, uh, that's pretty damn impressive. Yeah. Cause we, we talked about that and we, you know, it was funny, like we shared the same kind of opinion on dyno testing. Yep. Like, you know, a 40 second dyno pull. <laughs> you know, not every know. something you want to do. I know. But again, it's got to do it in a car. Couple For a couple miles. Hey, one week till Canadians start heading south. You know how they hate going south, those Canadians. One week to drag week, man. I know. Yeah. It's a rumor I'm hearing. Okay. Actually, actually, I just saw it on the chat room. Ah. We go north, they go south with the point. So, I think we go more east than anything. No, we would go west. west. That too. <laughs> <laughs> Where the fuck are you going? <laughs> I don't know. <coughs> Who knows? So, let's talk fighting. Let's talk fight sports. Oh yeah. I'm sure. I'm sure some of our listeners listen to listen come on, come on and head on, head on to you. Yeah, right. I lost five bucks to Nathan Horgan. And I got to pay him. You did? And I'm, I'm tempted to not pay him with PayPal. Tempted to. Oh, just when we see him. When I see him at Drag Week, give him like a. A sock of, nic- a sock of nickels. <laughs> what? Yeah. How, um, a roll of nickels. How much is that? <laughs> is uh, it $5? Uh, two, two bucks. Is it two, two bucks? So yeah, you give him two, two, two and, and, and a, a tip. And some pennies. And some pennies. Two rolls and a, a couple rolls of pennies. A roll of good. pennies. Two rolls of pennies. That's tough for Todd. Don't. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> okay. The math. <laughs> Hand him a calculator. But I, I lost five bucks, and I I personally thought, even though he lost, he did a tremendous job. I don't think all these people running their grills about, oh, well, you know, he's the greatest fighter ever, you know, Mayweather. Yeah. Yeah. He's a great boxer. Yep. Yeah. He's 40. Jeez, you know. Well, I, whatever you want, however you want to look at it, but understand this. This guy's not a boxer. Nope. Right. He got in the ring with this guy and went 10 rounds. And may, maybe it could have went eight. Maybe he could have finished. I, I don't know. Maybe. I wonder how much time he wasted not doing shit because he was thinking so much about not throwing that elbow that we talked oh, about. Oh, I yeah. saw that one. Yeah. I, I can't tell you what round it was, but boy, I was watching that. And he he hit him with like a right and then came across with a left. And then he had his arm yeah. loaded to just go across his face and he, and he I watched stop him himself. stop it. Yeah. And that's where all these conspiracy theory guys are saying, oh, he was pulling punches. He wasn't hitting them. Yeah. No, it's because he would have broke the well, guy's face in and half. And he, he was probably thinking about it like, oh, Well, the shit. ref was breaking everything up all the time too, yeah. so. There Let's, was an interesting thing about that that Tom has some 
insight on that yeah. I, I happen to notice, and I don't follow boxing all that much. Nor but, do I. Well, my kid boxes, or you know, he used to box and he trained for for an MMA and he does all that. You know, he did all that crazy stuff. He never fought, but he just he did it. He sparred and everything, and you know, he he watched the fight with that you know kind of eye, and he pre- he pretty much said that McGregor did really well. He he won like four rounds. Uh, in the beginning, yeah, and before then he got tired, but. yeah, and then he gassed out. But he did say that it was weird how, whenever the ref broke him up, it would be like he it, it didn't take any time. He'd get between them, mm-hmm. and as soon as he started stepping back, he didn't even push him push the fighters back. He would step away, and and uh, Mayweather would be punching already, right? Except the time that McGregor hit him with the uppercut, right? And that time he got in there, and there was all kind of like pushing and shoving and everything. It was like a fifteen second. Yeah, know, a little or, melee or, or deal. Now I didn't see it, so I don't know. And I'm not listen. I'm not a conspiracy theorist at all. <laughs> I think uh, he went well. Not with that. No, I'm <laughs> giving Tom a look like <laughs> yeah, well, I know. <laughs> like you asshole. Yeah, you people have to He's see the this. original tinfoil hat guy. That's true. Um, no, I, listen. Uh, McGregor did great. He uh, he lasted longer than a lot of people thought. He was out of his element. Uh, you know, Mayweather wouldn't last a minute if they fought in an octagon, but that wasn't the deal. You know, no, it wasn't and, the deal, and and it's not going to be the deal. Mayweather would be crazy to do it. He said he wouldn't do it smartly, and <laughs> we're all the idiots because they both made a hundred million. Yeah. Oh yeah. And so I'm not an idiot. No, I'm not either because because <laughs> we didn't pay for it. I'm testing. Um, I'm working with a a Russian TV provider to to get their shit squared away. So I happen to have you know test subs, and for whatever reason, it was on like channel one in Russian, and I've I've had a watch and pay attention to streams and so much of this stuff, I can tune out the foreign language. So right. I'll, what I'll watch is I'll find, they all watch U.S. stuff. Yeah. That's what they watch over there. Yeah. There's very little of like the dancing bears and all, all yep. the shit like you yep. think. Yep. Um, so I would, I, I can not hear Polish or Russian. It just like goes in one ear and out the other. And the audio track for the English is always on the back, but quiet. Yeah. And I can pull it out. Well, this one, <laughs> I guess the announcers were there. And there was no audio track. No. Yeah, no. it was Russian announcing for yeah, the Russian and audience. Russian's a harsh language, yeah. dude. It's yeah, <laughs> yep. da. So all, I, you, all I, you get is like the occasional Boris or something <laughs> like that. Like, yeah, you're like you know, yeah, it must be his name. I, I the one guy that works for me, his name is Boris. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, for real. Uh, it's uh, look, I don't care what anybody wants to say about the guy. I think the guy's a hell of an athlete. Um, to me, McGregor doesn't have anything to be embarrassed about well at the at end all. when the, he's like hey they should have knocked me down look at me i'm conscious i'm talking to you i'm not like you know I'm he, not did seem, up. he did seem remarkably straight uh-huh for getting jostled but i think that those guys they're they, used to it they might get scrambled and return yeah. to consciousness that's why he said i'd rather be on the mat then you can call me out he goes i was standing why'd he call me out that's what what kind of knockouts that well, and I agree, but well, I thought he, I honestly, I thought he was a little bit of a dick and I thought Mayweather was actually very gracious. I got a lot of respect for the guy. Yeah. yeah. Well, well I mean, they're, they're at the end, they're like doing their man hug. Oh, thanks. You know, how hard enough, is it to be buddy. not to be gracious when you just made a hundred well, yeah. million? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And all the memes showing up with freaking them, you know, the, the pictures of them in bed, throwing money in the yeah. air and like 46 minutes worth of what's that per hour? hundred million, 46 minutes. Oh God. It's a lot of money. I couldn't even imagine. Yeah. And Tom and I were joking like they were talking about, all right, like here's what we're gonna do with the weigh in. <laughs> yeah. I'm I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna steal your bag. <laughs> you know, you're gonna you're gonna almost call me the N word and uh, you know, blah blah blah. It, it's gotta be it, it, whatever. All right. One of one of our guys is telling me he'll give me five bucks and not talk about it anymore. So <laughs> No, uh, he said he'd give me five bucks. Shut up, you dick. <laughs> oh, he did say you. Yeah, well whatever. he covered your bet. Oh, that's right. The guy right in front said two weeks, Thomas. How why is he calling me? Do you call me Thomas on the air? Sometimes. Yeah, you do. I usually call you Thomas when I'm taking a terse tone. With yes, you. <laughs> you are. That's right. Yeah. Thomas. Um, now, I, I, again, we don't have to rehash the fight thing um, anymore. Uh, I lost five bucks fair and square, and uh, I got a PayPal. I was going to do it today, and I just I got jammed up. I didn't lose anything. No. Nor, nor did I. I lost another pound on vacation, which is crazy, because I ate like a poof. Yeah, I, that's right. You you just got back. You were done. Dump your, uh, your tree on the house thing rectified yet? Tomorrow they do the uh, screen porch. Everything else is fixed. Okay, good. Did you make out all right insurance-wise? Yep. Nice. Yep, all handled. All right, so I guess the plan for us is to head to Drag Week. We are going to figure out what we're going to do. Uh, I guess as good a time to tell you, uh, the backup plan we had uh, is probably not going to pan out. 
No, the, the backup plan was a it was a shot in the dark, and it, it was a car lease that wasn't you know. Don't want to hurt somebody no. else's car. Yeah, you know? it, it's it's a tough deal. <clears throat> well, that's where you get into. We didn't think I didn't think we were going to need the backup car. I really didn't. Neither did I. And I kind of, you know, <laughs> neither did I. Plan C. And you know, my tongue is slowly being bitten in half. Eh. But. It is what it is. It wasn't for lack of trying. You know, I listened to a couple of our old episodes and you were sitting there telling Fudd, I'm telling you, you're not going to have your car. I'm going to be there. It's like, oh. listen, here's the bottom line. I have a car in progress. I know. I don't know uh, what the fuck he's got. <laughs> yeah. He's got a tree house that's not done yet. <laughs> a tree house and a swing <laughs> and, and set. He, and and a, he put a pool up in, at the end of August. I don't even understand that one. Well, you got to learn how to cover it. So he put it up. It's probably covered. No, already. you don't cover them, dude. You just let the you, water you, out of them. Shut up. Well, no, you, no. you pull the oh thing my out. The, God. You, pull the, you pull the plug out the side and let the air out. Does he have all his teeth? But in fairness. He must be. Hold on. He's in fairness, boy. I believe Shane posted a picture on Facebook and he had the exact same pull. <laughs> Shane doesn't let the water out. Well, I don't think he has to where he lives, does no. he? That does, probably doesn't have snow there either. That's right. But he would cover it. Or he would he would have something he would something would happen that would be really cool. Yeah, he wouldn't let the water out. But yeah. but back to the drag week thing. It's um it's a pretty tough thing to use somebody's car that's that capable. And what it would have come down to is if if kind of if you broke it, you bought it sort of thing. Yeah. And look, I want to do this. I really did want to do it with my own stuff. I I didn't really want to do it with somebody else's, and I sure as hell. <laughs> Like let's take where let's say we're talking about a GTR, which is which, what, which is what we were talking about. Yeah. Um. If you happen to look at the price of one of those transes, if something went wrong, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you could be thirty grand in a hole. Yeah. Well, everybody we talked to you, so if you far, don't crash it. Yeah. 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 So, look, I can assure you with this that, like I said it in I think in episode one seventeen, I did everything I could do. There, there was nothing more I could do to get this done. And we're, this car by so help me fucking God, this car will be done before it snows here. It will be done and it will be tested in Florida. Yeah. And it'll come back here and we'll have plenty of time. I, th to I think everybody believes that the car is in process. I mean, you know, seeing as chassis prison is not some figment of our <laughs> imagination. Chassis jail. jail. Please chassis, get the whatever terminology is. correct. Oh, sorry. Chassis jail. <laughs> whatever it is. Um, you know, I, I think they believe it and it, you know, it, it is going to happen, but it's just, it's a shame. Um, and actually Chris is saying right now, see us at Byron is Byron, is Byron the best place to go to, for us to go? Because, well, we because, were, that, because that's what I said. It's midweek. Yeah. We were discussing, I mean, look, as much as here, then now we've got to take another turn into Mike's personality. Uh, when my brother stopped racing circle track, I don't go. Right. I don't, I don't get, and it's not, then you shut the fuck up with your antisocial shit. Cause that'll be the next shit out of your mouth. Those are my peoples. Yo, I was actually going to say that. I'm sure you were. <laughs> I, uh, I was going to say social misfits. Actually, Ooh. that's what I say. I just, I, I don't, if I'm not involved with the competition, I kind of don't really want to go. I just, I mean, it, look, we're going to get out there. Aren't we going to beat up Richard Mogul? No, I'm not going to beat him up. Poor oh, guy. No. Oh. I mean, I we'll, we'll get out there, and I mean, we were just talking about how and when, and you know, when people can go, and making sure Tad didn't have a White Castle appointment he was going to miss or anything. So <laughs> we're okay. I mean, we'll we'll be out there, and we were talking about specifically Byron, but we'll see how it goes. Yeah, yep. but we'll we'll be there, so you'll get to to meet our re retarded asses in person. All right. Well, without further ado, Kenny Dotweiler, how are you, sir? I'm doing fine. And yourself? Fantastic. Uh, I want to say before we even get started, thank you so much for coming on. And there's an awful lot of people that are really looking forward to this. Oh, yeah. An awful lot. Well, hope, hope we don't disappoint them. I don't think that's going to happen. No, I don't think it's going to happen. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> so you and I talked for a fair amount of time on the phone the other day, and I, I told everybody that I had to stop talking to you because it was essentially everything we'd like to talk about here. And I know <laughs> that this is kind of a hard thing to, to ask somebody, but how did you get started in this? Like, like what lit this spark for you to go? That this was direction? a long time ago. Yeah. Uh, it probably was pretty easy. Uh, my dad had a repair shop and so I got introduced to every aspect of it from blowing break drums off, you know, inhaling that stuff to a little bit of everything. And as we went along, uh, being an avid drag racing nut and thinking that dinos must be the latest thing to, to have, I 
was able to buy a wheel dyno. So we put the wheel dyno in the shop, and uh, that, you know, then that kind of turned it off into uh, the high performance part that I wanted to be in, and went along with that for quite a while, and then had a, a chance to meet um, a guy that John Foley, who was working for Buick Special Products, and his his job was to go out in the field and try to get people interested in, in using Buick V6 uh, performance parts. And uh, luckily, he lived here in town, so he came by one day with some stage two Buick heads and showed them to me. I thought that's really pretty spectacular. And uh, up to that point, I'd already bought a, a little super flow bench and was grinding on cylinder heads, and we had a they were involved with some boat drag racing, car drag racing. Uh, so it was even had an off-road customer at one point in time there. So it was all all kind of starting to tie in together. And uh, as as that rolled along, the affiliation with the Buick Special Products guys kind of led into more and more work. And eventually I just kind of moved across the driveway and to another shop and started working full-time in that area. Now, the, the Buick Stage 2 head, um, I'm probably a little fuzzy on that particular head. Was that a... Was that what kind of led to the Chevy Buick head, or was that? Yeah, Dart. Dart actually did a version of the Buick head for the V8, and it was pretty much a a good clone. Uh, what Buick did is they they were involved in the Bush series, and they really didn't have uh, when they when they got involved, they didn't have anything. They had a production V6, so they quickly drew up uh, cylinder head and blocks and cranks that they could do internally and. The cylinder head ended up being a symmetrical port head with uh, six bolts per cylinder. And the neat thing about the Buick head is the six bolts were actually in rotation. So you had very good clamping. Mm -hmm. And um, at the point in time, this was way back, probably 1985 or 86, um, they had the opportunity to do some porting on them. And they they were flowing, at that time, they were flowing numbers in the 320 CFM range at 28 inches, which was... You know, compared to a 23 or an 18 degree Chevy head, it's pretty spectacular. So I uh, even made a brash statement one time with one of the magazine guys about that head. I said it's the best head available right now for a small block anything, and and it was probably true at that point in time. And uh, we were able to get uh, on a 280 inch Buick, we could get a little over 600 horsepower in drag race mode with them. So. Um, pretty, uh, you know, it's pretty good at that time, and then they eventually went into doing the aluminum head version of it, and uh, we're still building some stuff or rebuilding stuff with that that head on it today, currently, and and its current iteration that head will support about eighteen hundred horsepower. Yeah, it's a uh, it's a charge on methanol, but yeah, really, really nice cylinder head back when it came to the Chevy side. Uh, it was a uh, had a lot yeah. of good points going for it. Yeah, Chevrolet eventually came out with a splay valve head, which uh, was equally good. And uh, so, the, so the Buick Stage Two was was actually after the eighteen degree head. Mm. Buick no. Stage Two heads coming out in nineteen eighty five. So uh, I'm not really sure when the Chevrolet guys moved from the the twenty three degree to the eighteen degree, but somewhere in that point in time, and it was. Uh, uh, Obviously, they had, you had the Chevrolets and the Buicks running in the uh, in the Cup Bush series. Series, yeah. yep. Yeah, yeah. And, because that motor we did, the, the, we were doing the Robbie Moroso V6. As we, I wasn't anything involved to speak of back then, but those little motors, they had a Buick V6 yep. uh, as a you know a Buick headed V6 like Chevy type. Yep, yep. And that was a it was a neat little motor for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, you know it, they did well at the time and. Um, you know, for me, it was kind of neat because my involvement with the Buick guys was they kind of leaned me over into the production cars, which were the, the turbocharged Grand Nationals at the time. And and I thought, gee, it'd be kind of nice if I could just be building stage two carbureted V6s. And then it dawned on me, why don't I just use all those parts and with the turbocharger stuff? Yep. And uh, that was one of my better ideas because that, it's, that was a long... Uh, enduring process, I guess you could say, it lasted for several years. So and, uh, the the involvement with the Buick and the cylinder head side of things 
you know, complemented the turbo stuff. And then that's how it all started to tie together into essentially what we know of Kenny Duttweiler today. It's kind of what put me on the map. Absolutely. It, and it was purely by accident. Um, and just being at the right place at the right time. And, uh, along with the association with Buick, you, you know, now you are introduced to all the magazine guys because they're always anxious to have magazine copy. And, and that was kind of an interesting thing to write about. So that really helped a lot because once you start getting magazine stories, um, they do a lot for you. And, uh, you know, as, as we spoke about the other day, it, it's, not you running an ad touting your product, but it's somebody using your product uh, with the proof of performance. So, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. And back then, the magazine really stuff was all of it. The magazine was it. Yeah. I mean, that's where it was. Oh, yep. Yeah. You got in a magazine. We had no internet. We, yep. we couldn't, we, had, we didn't have Facebook where you could come off the dyno and 15 minutes later, you've got videos and the whole thing. I mean, it's, it's, it certainly changed over time, but uh, it, back then it was good. And, you know, and I was an avid reader of Hot Rod Magazine. I, uh, couldn't wait for those things in super stock magazine and all those guys. Uh, they were, uh, that was our, our 30 day late insight to what was going on. Speaking of stock and super stock, he blew my mind because my dad had a, a station wagon Yep. that, and my dad had a, a unique sense of humor and it, it was kind of like a cross between ball busting and dad jokes. And there was a guy he raced against. His name was Dave Colbert. And Dave Colbert always had cars called Bad Banana. So when my father put together a car to race against Dave, he called it the Terrible Tangerine. And ah. Keddy had actually mentioned it to me, the the station wagon. I thought that was pretty amazing. Yep. But that's yeah. all that stuff was what you had back then. You had magazines. That's it. There there was no no nothing. You had to wait for it to come. Yeah, it always go by this one liquor store that always had, uh, I forget what it was, was super stock or one of those magazines. And they were about the first ones to get them. So I would routinely roll by there till the magazine was on the shelf and then I'd buy it and run home and read it. And, uh, and then drag news was better because now drag news was every week and, uh, you got to keep up with it. And then I think, uh, drag news faded and then it became national dragster or, or national dragster replaced it. But, um, I bought my, 62 Plymouth Ram Charger because of an ad in Drag News, you know, and I thought, I saw how fast those cars were, and there was a dealer in L.A. that had 11 or 12 of them in stock, so I just went down there and bought one. Wow. And about the ugliest thing I've ever owned in my life, but it, it was uniquely different, and um, it was the Max Wedge, so they were reasonably fast at the time. They were about 13 flat at 109, I think, was what ran on street tires, and you know, and from there, you could get them to go pretty quick. And uh, they're still being raced now in, the, I think, it's Nostalgia. Yeah. Super stock in NHRA. And, uh, of course, they're about three seconds quicker than when we were running them at that point in time. A little bit more expensive, too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. A little bit. Probably, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm a guy that sold a, a 64 aluminum Hemi car without the engine and transmission in it for, I don't know, it was $1,200 or something. Oh. Yeah. Is that now, still painful? It's worth anything. Yeah, I still think about it. <laughs> you know, it sold the Hemi engine to a guy with a roadster and uh, had the body sitting there, and I wanted a dirt bike. And <laughs> oh, I, God. <laughs> so I, that, was a, that was a pretty pretty sensible trade, wasn't it? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. It had destroyed in about six months for a car that probably, if I would have retained, it would have been worth six-digit numbers instead. Oh, yeah. That, uh, high, yeah, high six-digit numbers. I mean, that's, that these things just, you know, didn't look like I was ever going to end. I mean, you know, 1964, we had the aluminum front end Amy cars, 65. They had the acid dip stuff. They had the Fords, uh, you know, the Chevrolets were doing some stuff. So you just figured it just, you know, routine. I mean, just going on, you know, so wait for the new one. And all of a sudden there was no new ones. Mm. And, uh, in fact, um, the interesting aspect of all that is when the Buick Grand National came out in 1984, it wasn't, wasn't all that fast, but it showed the potential. And then the '86 intercool cars come along, and and in the late '80s and early '90s, they were the fastest thing you could buy. Yep. And you know, I got to tell you, uh, a friend of mine who guy used to live next door to me. We were kids, Rich, Rich D. Francisco, 
we went to a Buick dealer and there was like this, this very, very elderly gentleman there when we were looking at it. And Rich was telling me, we got to go look at these things. And I'm like, dude, <laughs> it's, it's like my Malibu, but new, it's you know, your, it's not your grandpa's, you know, and here's this guy saying, I'm telling you this thing will whoop your best car. <laughs> you know, and I'm like, get the hell out of here. And you know, then all of a sudden you find out that it, it was a good secret for about oh, yeah. five minutes. And then look what it turned into. Yep. Oh yeah. You know, we, the Buick guys wanted me to run a, a Buick, uh, in stock eliminator. So I went back to, uh, Flint and we looked at the stuff and they had a, a car there they'd use as a styling exercise, but it actually had the, it was a couple of year old model at the time, but it was actually, I think 1985 current or something. So anyway, they sent me a bunch of engines and, uh, the car and no money, just here you go have at it. So we, prepped the car and went to the Winter Nationals with John Beckles from Hot Rod Magazine driving the car. And uh, we were kind of scorned of the staging lanes because all of a sudden you have this turbocharged, fuel-injected thing sitting there next to all these old carbureted deals, and, and everybody just knew that we were sandbagging. And, you know, so I think the first outing we got refactored four classes up, and then uh, – Due to some conflicts of interest between myself and Farmer Dismu, uh, I was asked to quit participating with that car, <laughs> and so it that was our last hand of running stock eliminator until the '86s came out, and Buick took a bunch of them to NHRA and let them drive them and look at them, and then all of a sudden they become very fond of that aspect of it, and then we were back in business with those cars in NHRA, and uh, they. Uh, uh, amazingly quick in, in stock form if you know if you took advantage of all the things you could do and uh we had a customer that ran a couple of those things for a long time and it was, it was really kind of interesting and then obviously the stage two twin turbocharged versions we ran uh had one of them with a 215 inch v6 in it that went uh seven i'm looking at the picture on the wall here 781 and 179 uh in super stock d and uh, at the time that was in uh I forget what year that was, but it took about six or seven years for one of these um Cobra Jet Mustangs actually ran in the sevens. Yeah, I was gonna say Super Stock D back then. That's a that's a hell of a number. Yeah. <laughs> My God. I mean, uh, no, no well it was uh, not super stock D, it was um it was that sport it was a compact category, what am I trying to say? Uh, was it was it uh D modified? No, it was double. Let's see. We had the. I have to look at the picture. I'll look at the name. Yeah, of they the had car, some some classes in there that this kind of stuff would have fallen into because I think it. Should've. Oh, like demodified production or something. Something because they couldn't like they didn't know what to do with these things. These yeah. newfangled cars so, yeah, that were coming in. They left them super stock instead of putting them over in the competition eliminator. Yeah, which they did which ultimately they put them in comp, comp right? Yeah, and uh, the then they come older turbo cars. I think they call them double B older, double C older. Yeah, double A. Super oh, super stock DX. There we go. DX. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. right. Because back then they're like, "This is experimental. We don't know what the hell we're yeah. doing." All these things with these yeah. funny hair dryer looking things, and yeah. you know, here's where we are. They didn't know what the hell they were doing anyway. Class. you know, so it's fifteen fifteen pounds per cubic inch. It was really created around the Volkswagens. Well, they just immediately. <laughs> Move the Volkswagens away out of the picture. Well, yeah, and uh, and not without controversy. We had, you know, they they probably weren't in great favor the first year or two we ran in that cat class because there again it was turbocharged and fuel injected. You know, and in the late eighties, the middle middle late eighties, that wasn't the norm. Well, so, they they didn't know anything about it till you know last year, actually. Well, I know, right? <laughs> the That's NHRA fine. guys. The Copa Camaros and the Cobra Jets started running, and uh, they, and now the Pro Stock guys are uh, not turbocharged, but obviously they're fuel injected. So it's uh, it's you know it, it was a, it had to evolve that way. I mean, it's just natural that uh, the turbocharged anything turbocharged pretty much has to be fuel injected in order to perform properly, and uh, you know trying to blow through or draw through a carburetor. Uh, wasn't necessarily the best thing we ever did. And uh, the I think we discovered that fuel injection stuff in the 
when John Meany came out with his DFI stuff, and it was pretty darn neat because now we could program these things. We didn't have to have a mass air sensor, and we, you know, we did a lot of limitations went away. And uh, we could make pretty good horsepower of that stuff. So uh, that was kind of how that all it all kind of fell in place over a period of about six or seven years there. And then, uh, of course, today every, almost everything we do is turbocharged. So I, I mean, realistically, when we talked about this, the the fuel injection enabled the, I guess I use the term, the exploitation of what a turbocharger could really do. Uh, I mean, it, it enabled you to do so much more than was ever possible. I mean, turbochargers by no means were new, but the way to to control everything nicely that was the that was kind oh, of the key. Yeah, what was really interesting is I think uh, we had a customer that had a. A T Bird, a twin turbocharged T Bird. And uh, he ran competition eliminator with it. And it, at the time, it was a real, a real anomaly because it was just way faster than. I remember that car. That, that uh, Hurley Blakeney's <coughs> yep. deal. Yeah, that, Hurley. Yeah, the black uh, car. It was, no, it actually was a greenish looking color. Oh, I thought it was black at one point. But uh, the. He ran, he ran comp for a couple of years with it, and uh, it was I'm trying to remember what we ended up running with that thing. I think it was Winter Nationals and around 1997 or 98, it ran 670 at 215. I remember. And it was just exactly what he's talking about there because Tommy Kling, Tommy Martino, and I were at work. We were at the shop. They were testing something there, and we were talking about it because, you know, Tommy was – all over comp, you know, before they moved to pro stock. Yep. And he was like, my God, he's like, will that ever, you know, is there ever anything they could do to make this thing kind of fit in? Cause it was ridiculous. It was that good. Yeah. It was, you know, I don't think we ever won anything in particular, but a lot of, a lot of uh, number one qualifiers because they didn't have it figured out how to factor the car. So you could always leave when I ran my, uh, my cutlass with the, the 287 inch in it and, Competition eliminator. You just one thing. You're, one thing was a given. When you showed up, you most likely get the, the number one qualifier money, which you know, like four or five hundred bucks. But it was, at least it paid for a little bit of the, the weekend. And then whether you won or not was probably not because they just weren't consistent enough at that time to to take on a carbureted small block with a power glide. Yeah, I think anybody that's involved with comp or super stock for for the most part, th- yeah, they'd like to win. But like I mean, from the engine builder side, all I wanted to see was that top sixteen at the end of the the qualifying things. That's all I ever wanted to know. Oh yeah, you wanted to be on on the on that on that sheet in National Dragster when they showed the qualifiers. Yep, yep. that top sixteen box. I can't. I can think back to those things <laughs> hanging on the door. Yep, I can see. it's the best thing in the world. <laughs> well, it's it's a credibility issue. I mean, uh, you know, if you can if you can do things like that. Even if nobody else pays any attention to it, it makes you feel good. Yeah, exactly. And uh, the customers are always happy because that's the little reward for the money they spend with you. And uh, you know, it's sometimes uh, some of these guys don't always get very much accolades on what they're doing. And uh, from the engine builder standpoint, in particular, because there's a lot of guys out there that do a really good job that just don't get a lot of notoriety out of it. <laughs> So Kenny, you you spend most of your time, if not all, kind of being an R and D shop, right? I mean, um, it seems to me, you know, we 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 talked a couple times last week, and um, it seems to me that you are always playing with something. Uh, tell you know, tell us a little bit about that that process, how it how it got to be that. Yeah, you, I, you know, like we had to we had to laugh one time. We built three identical engines for uh, uh, an NMCA car, Bob Rieger's uh, Chevrolet. And it's the first time I think I'd ever built three of the same engine. <laughs> yeah. Ever. Because every time you, well, you you know, you put one together and you got a better idea for the next one. Yeah. So uh, that was uh, kind of a, a standing joke around the shop here. But, you know, we, we do a little bit of everything. I mean, it's, there's Buick V6s here still. There's uh, a single red single cam 427 Ford on the dyno right now. And, uh, LS engines, there's a lot of those uh, that go to, I mean, for me, I mean, they're, they're not huge numbers, but, but never too alike. Yeah. And that's, that's gotta be fun work. Uh, you'd kind of never get bored. 
Um, you know, I, I spent a lot of time in the Middle East, and I know, um, I guess it was not too, too many years ago. Uh, you, didn't you get contracted to build that crazy V6 for the hill climber guys? We did a couple. Actually, we did uh, some Buick. A couple of guys bought Buick V6s, the Stage 2 ones. Yep. And they worked out really successfully. I think the first year they ran the Buick, they won overall against the V8s and everybody. And it was more about power management than it was horsepower. But, you know, they just did a better job with a limited tire. And then we ended up doing a couple of 440-inch billet CFE, basically a CFE billet uh, big block, but as a V6. Yep. That's and what I remember. Those were really potent. And then we had the opportunity to dyno initially the Allen Johnson 565 cubic inch that uh, he did for uh, the shoot there in the, in the Cotter, the Allen Obby guys. Yep. And that was that was a monster. I mean, you know, 2,500 foot pounds of torque at 5,000 and 3,000 horsepower at 7,200. It was pretty impressive. Yeah. And and throwing sand and and the biggest problem they had was uh, from what I've I've seen over there is the fuel management because you're going up such a steep hill, you know you're fighting all of it. You're fighting fuel weight and g force and all that stuff. Anyway, no, the biggest issue those guys fight is they don't leave anything alone when they get it. Well, yeah, that too. Okay, <laughs> the, fair enough. <laughs> they they you know go you know they'll take something that's dialed in pretty good, put it on a wheel dyno, and then start beating on it. And uh, I know the guys. Sent me some data back. Uh, I dynoed the engine at 45 pounds of boost, and they had it on a wheel dyno at 60. And why, um, why not? You know, major, major revisions in the fuel map, obviously. And uh, but they that they like to do things like that. They like to. When I told them that they could use nitrous to spool a torque converter, <laughs> they just didn't let the nitrous off until they got to the top of the hill. <laughs> it, it helped spool it up, and it made more power. So they just, you know. I'm looking at the data when they, when I get the, I think I, I think they sent me an engine for rebuild. We had the computer and stuff with it, and I downloaded what was in the computer. So that little deal that was supposed to go to 15 pounds of boost and then turn off just never went off. <laughs> and the, uh, as it turned out, the the turbochargers and the and the nitrous aren't all that bad together. Yeah, I guess they they like each other, make it, especially there with all the heat. Yeah, it, it helped pull the heat out in. Yep. You've already built the engine to accommodate more cylinder pressure anyway, so uh, it basically built like a like a, a nitrous motor to start with. And yeah, well, I, I've told these guys it has to be pretty darn heavy anyway to to survive. Yeah, I've I've told these guys All a story. A and, um, they're interesting customers, though. They're they're you know they they let you they just kind of tell you what they want. And then let you go ahead and just use your imagination to build it. And that's, that's, that's the fun part. Yeah. Well, money's not a problem. Not that For I've most seen. of them, but you know, it's interesting. I had uh, one group of guys, uh, a whole bunch of guys got together and pooled all their money to do a project like that. And, uh, so, uh, you know, we, we kind of get spoiled with the thought that, you know, they all have a lot of money to spend, but then there's a, a lot of guys over there that just have the racing fever, just like everybody here in the States. And, uh, if you know, they want to do something bad enough, they'll get together and, uh, throw money in the pile and, and build something. And, uh, you kind of have to appreciate that. It's kind of, kind of neat. Yeah, no doubt. Maybe worked a little harder for it. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's not a disposable toy anymore. It's got value. <laughs> yeah. It's not going to be laying outside their building in the sand, uh, after they run it a couple of times, like some of the stuff, you know, they just, they blow them up and yeah. throw them on the ground and go get another one. Yeah. Get by no one. Yeah. Yeah. Get, yeah because they can. <laughs> so so uh, I guess yeah. all of this, like most of what you're doing now is involving other than normally aspirated, which I guess all came from your work with the Buicks. I mean, that must've been where you, for lack of a better term, learned the ins and outs of turbocharging and what engines like and why. I mean, is is that like? I mean, is it fair to say that, that the Buicks are what brought you into the turbo side of things? Oh, ab- absolutely. Because after a few years of doing the Buicks, I'm thinking, you know, I don't do this Clark Kent thing and be typecast. Uh, we need to do something else. So, um, had a customer in uh, back in your area in New York, uh, at racing Jason, uh-huh. and he had a, a Mustang convertible. So we did a twin turbo small block. Ford for it 
and uh, it was really fast, got a lot of notoriety, I think primarily because it was a convertible. And uh, that led to a pretty big influx of the Fords. And then uh, a few years later, right around uh, probably the year 2000, somewhere in that way, this Bob Reeder was running the NMCA with mountain motor stuff, and he decided that he'd watching the, these guys from New York, and yeah, they were down in uh, uh, Speed World or someplace down there. And they were sitting there doing nothing, and uh, his guys were over there, you know, prepping that 800-inch motor to go make another round. And so he, he asked a friend of mine, he says, uh, why don't those guys work on that car? And the guy says, well, it's turbocharged. <laughs> and he said, so he immediately called me and, and bought two engines uh, just because of the fact these guys were faster than him and didn't have to work on it. And uh, then the Chevrolet thing really took off because he, he put them on the map. And uh, and then, of course, now, you know, it's just ballooned into uh, big blocks and small blocks and all kinds of iterations out there. I mean, these guys uh, know they can go fast with the turbos. And, and the, the, that bump deal with the trans brake uh, made them competitive, basically eliminated that uh, – lag on the starting line where you'd most likely get beat if you didn't uh, build the boost quick enough. And so now they, they bump in up for the boost just like uh, like they would. Well, they pre-stage at full boost and then just bump yep. forward to 12 inches. And and so they're ready to go. You can red light with them now, which you couldn't do in the, in the beginning because they, they pretty much required a clutch to be competitive. And uh, we had an anti-lag system that we use it. They popped and banged like crazy, but they would build boosts almost immediately. But getting the clutch car to to work properly with with the turbos uh, as as they got bigger and more aggressive, it got harder and harder with the clutch management. So the automatics really took over. I mean, and I think it's about 99% of everybody out there now is running either a two or three speed automatic. Yeah, I would imagine the clutch side of things gets pretty involved with a with a with a changing horsepower rate and trying to get the thing to leave right and not shake the tires and yeah, gear changes. Nobody, That's got to get really tough. I don't think anybody even does well, it anymore at the power levels that they're at. It was incredibly tough. I know in my comp car, it was might as well run might as well have been running pro stock because every pass the transmission was slid back. You put pull the clutch and we had the machine there. We cut the disc and everything and had plenty of flat floaters and so if you made six passes you probably had the transmission out four times but That's when we work. tried to fix that with a better clutch the dis- the difference between shake and not shaking was such a fine line that we just never could achieve it so we go back to the the clutch that you had to work to get the thing to not to slip and then the car go down the track every time and but you paid that price you had to do a lot of maintenance and now you run an automatic in that same deal you come back in the pits, you plug your transmission cooler in and circulate the fluid and bring it down to 100 degrees, and now you're ready to go for the next round, and there's no, you know, no added work. There's not that 45 minutes of thrash you had to go through every time you did a clutch change. So, uh, the and the automatics are awfully reliable now, too, so that, that doesn't hurt anything either. Now, one of our guys... And want- might add, pretty expensive. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they are. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, yeah, one, they're coming up. One of our guys wanted to ask you. Um, so you, I know you're saying you've built engines uh, at every manufacturer out there. He, uh, they want to know about the two JZ stuff. How how long were you involved in that? The- uh, you know, off and on there for a few years. Uh, the guys at Titan Motorsports there in Florida, um, and Brad Personette, who was working for them at the time there, we we dynoed some of the stuff they they were running, and we were able to and, you know show them areas they could really improve on. And uh, it's an amazingly good engine. I mean, uh, yeah, they are one of those pound for pound best engines in the world type of deals. And uh, you know, the current version of that stuff that they're running, and uh, I think it's in Bahrain there that he can do racing guys. Yep. In particular, I mean, those those things are just ungodly fast. And uh, when you look at what's making that horsepower, it's kind of hard to to believe that. You know, that small bore, fairly long stroke, cylinder head that not every port flows the same uh, due to the end, the end ports being a little bit different stuff. 
And but yet when you you hang a great big turbo on those things, they just fly. Yeah, turbochargers are like magic. But so you said you picked them up. What, what did you pick up specifically in the two J? Like where was the area? Uh, was it in oh, the cylinder it head or tuning and stuff? Oh yeah, they, they'd really never had the, the privilege of having them on an engine dyno. So the fuel mapping was uh, best you could do just going down a racetrack and uh, maybe possibly on a wheel dyno, which isn't really the easiest way to do it. So we, I think we found a lot in that area. And uh, we even had the, an opportunity to take the 1FZ engine, which yep. is their three-point-something liter deal. Anyway, we destroked that one to 210 inches, and uh, it made exactly 1,800 horsepower at 10,200. And this was in a period of time when the turbochargers were pretty antiquated, I guess we call them, you know, that they've improved so much over the years. But at that t- point in time, that was 210 inches and then and 1,800 horsepower. So a pretty good number when you, they're horsepower per cubic inch. Yeah, it really and, is. Um, the, and the, now the two, uh, and the two JZs, they, they surpass that easily. So it's, uh, yeah, I want to say two J, their 2Js make about 3,000 now, no? Oh, they're splitting the blocks in half now, yeah. so. Well, you, you have a bill of They got the bill of block now. And you run 110 pounds of boost. Oh, my God. And uh, turn them about 10,000 RPMs, and it's magic. Yeah. <laughs> so. Which were smooth. Yeah. yeah. Very cool. So what's your what's on your plate now? Like, what's your latest um, stuff that you're r and You know, well, Bonneville just rolled by us. We just got done with that. And so uh, that's one of those deals. When we finish Speed Week, we start planning for the, the one the following year. And uh, so that's, that's always fun. And that's, that's a real test of, of endurance there. You know, you get, when you get a five-mile run, and our driver simply goes to wide open throttle off the push truck, which means about 35 miles an hour. He's wide open and he lifts the end of the fifth mile. So uh, there is no pedal on it. There's no easing off on it. It's just five miles of torture. And uh, they seem to live amazingly well. Figuring that you know that's not your norm. That's not the norm. A minute and ten seconds of wide open throttle, and then yeah, we we kind of break it down in how much boost we have in, in certain increments and uh, the last 27 seconds were over 40 pounds of boost and this year the last seven or eight seconds we were over 50 wow so, uh, and the engine made two back-to-back passes and uh when we pulled the plugs out everything was still on the plugs and there's no water in the cylinders <laughs> and there's no water pressure in the cooling tower so essentially that engine would have made another pass and uh and we're not, we're not easy on them i mean we turn them uh in the low 9,000 range, 92, 9,300. What platform is it? And it's a dark iron eagle is the basis for it and has the dark little chief heads on. And uh, the pair of ProMod 88s is the, is the power generation. And an interesting tidbit on all this came up one day. We were uh, doing a magazine article with these guys in England, this uh, high-power media. And it's a pretty high-end magazine, one of them $20 an issue things or something. And they, they wanted to know a lot of information. So I was, I was looking up some stuff on it, and the 388-inch motor had made 2662 at 44 pounds, I believe the number was. And we ran it also without the turbos, uh, probably before the turbos went on it. And it was right in the, in the area of 640 horsepower. So if you look at it, Wow. We added 2,000 horsepower to a platform <laughs> with the turbos. And wow. that, that's just that's where the insanity comes in. Yes, it's hard. That's to, staggering. Put a thought on. Yeah, you you take the 640 horsepower engine and put these two monster turbos on it and a whole bunch more fuel in it, and now you're up 2,000 horsepower. Yeah, you picked uh, you picked it really up 2,000. Yeah. And it's not uncommon. I think all three of those engines that we, we run all made somewhere in the 600 range. And even the 300-inch engine was over, a little over 2,000. And uh, the we haven't dyno the new LS version engine yet, but it's probably, due to the better airflow and cubic inches, it's probably closer to 3,000 horsepower. And it only made just a little over 700 normally aspirated. So 
I guess we took 700 and added two, that'd be 27 something. So Wow. <laughs> what cylinder head uh, is on the uh, LS? It's that new Dart Pro Stock, uh, I guess they call it the Pro Stock 10 degree. Okay. It's, what? Um, it's a head that they developed for uh, NMCA's 400 inch Pro Stock rule deal. Well, that sounds pretty neat, actually. Yeah, yeah it does. Uh, what uh, what RPM range are they running? Like, I mean, like you said that this thing gets up to, you know, it's wide open throttle, traction managed. You know, where is its operating range, like, at the soft flats? It, well, we have a seven speed. So uh, if you make a gear change at 9,000, they drop about, uh, the, gear, the gear drops are about 12 or 13% on each gear. So you're dropping, you know, 13, 1400 RPMs. So, uh, once you, if you gear change it, uh, like the 300 inch, we actually shift it about 9,600. And um, it makes peak torque at about 8,000. But it never drops to 8,000, so it's always above the peak torque number when the gear change is made. Where for that whole run. Yeah. And it's a manual trans? It's a seven feet Liberty. Uh, okay, yeah. Clutchless Liberty. It's a, it's the same thing as the, the, like they run the Pro Stock, the five speed, they run the Pro Stock. Yep. But we, we wanted to, uh, I guess you could call it a push-off gear, a gear to get away from the push truck. Yep. Because we were running a 266 low with a 180 final drive. So oh, my God. You really run it out there, you had 150-mile-an-hour low gear. So the problem was we'd push it way too far to get any kind of speed to put it in gear, which by that, I mean 11, 1,200 feet when he would leave the push truck. So. The thought was, why don't we, and at that point, he's only doing like 55 miles an hour, 60 miles an hour. So the thought was, well, we need, a, we need a, a deeper low gear just to get away from the push truck. And so we lobbied for a six-speed, and then Craig says, well, you know, if I leave reverse out, I can make a seven-speed. <laughs> so we got the seven-speed, and now we have a 330 or 355 low, depending on the unit. And at so about 30, 35 miles an hour, it just drives away. And uh, Granny gear. It, it's a, it's like a truck with a deep low gear, you know? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. But the clutchless seven speed was a, was a real deal. Or even the clutchless five speed is a really neat deal. Cause all the driver does is push the button. You know, it's, he doesn't have to touch the clutch. Uh, but, uh, putting it in gear on the push truck, you just bring the engine up to a couple thousand. And when you get up to about 30 or 40 miles an hour on the dash there, he just pokes it in gear and drives off. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if anybody's ever looked at this car, you can tell there's no need for reverse in it. Yeah. No, I can. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think you can back that one up. <laughs> no, not too easy. No. Hard time getting that in a parking space. So he really exactly. does just go flat footed. Right to he right yeah, to the wood and And we just uh we drive the car to the other end through the boost and traction management and uh sometimes it's not always that good. I mean sometimes we'll get some in conditions where the wheel speed, the rear wheel speed gets quite a bit above ground speed, and then that intervention is timing, and uh, all of a sudden you're down, you know, timing values anywhere from six or seven degrees to a minus two or three. And uh, at that point, the engine is pretty well down on power, and EGT start to climb pretty good. So we kind of work our way through that by making it gearing it high enough where it can't really spin the tires easy and stuff like that. But it's a, if we could ever make a good run without a lot of that timing intervention, it would be, uh, and, and actually not spin the tires to the point that the cord starts to show, which they do a lot. Um, it, there's another 20 miles an hour in those things easily. It's just, uh, you just have to figure that since we don't want the driver to pedal it, then we, we pedal it for him. And, uh, the, Consequence is sometimes your your incremental speeds are a little soft, but once it gets into sixth and seventh gear, uh, the car actually in a mile and a quarter gained fifty three miles an hour with the finish line. Wow. And uh, most of the stuff uh, like the, the blower cars or the twin engine cars stuff like that, they'll pick up maybe ten or fifteen on the on the from their entry to exit, and uh, the turbocharger stuff is still pulling like a freight train when it goes through the end of the fifth mile. So it, but you got to get the fifth mile entry speed up also. So that's, that's our uh, challenge for next year is to try to uh, accelerate a little faster. Well, that's what I was just going to ask you at this point in time. Is it, 
is it I'm trying to to figure out a way to vocalize what I'm thinking. Is it a, a matter of acceleration, you know, more than it's a matter of horsepower? Is it more management to get you to the point that because I'd imagine as they go faster, they generate probably a little more downforce or is that dynamic? So you can put yeah, more and more power in at the we've end. Had the, we've had the car in a wind tunnel and we do actually have some downforce, even though it's pretty slippery. Uh, so no small part of it actually comes from the exhaust. And, uh, but we've talked about wings and removable wings and all, you know, wings that fold up and go down into the body and stuff. But, uh, I think the drag from the wing would probably not be doing us any favors. Uh, the biggest thing is trying to control the wheel speed through gear ratio. Uh, because obviously you don't want to gear it too low because, you know, you just, and then it will spin the tire. So we, we try to gear it pretty high. And in fact, we have it geared to where it can go through in sixth gear or seventh gear, depending on how many RPMs you want to run it to. But um, that, I think, and the there's a, there's a possibility that, you know, run a little less boost early on would not have the intervention of the timing control, which was which is our biggest detriment because when we make a pull and, you know, if you happen to go through a, a retarded or a lower timing value on the dyno, we had one engine a few years ago that, that in fact, it had one of Hurley Blakeney's uh, drag strip things in it where we pull the timing down to about 10 degrees at, well, when he had the clutch in. Well, it went through that range and the engine dropped 400 horsepower and then picked it back up again. So it just had a, a big hole in the, mm-hmm. in the curve. And uh, and it was right where it went through that, that low timing value number. So we know that when you start pulling the timing out of it, even if it's a 2,500 horsepower engine, it might be a 13 or 1,400 horsepower engine when it's in that mode. So getting a higher average horsepower is always what you're trying to achieve. I guess the middle of the run is where you have all the problems with wheel speed and, and uh, ground speed, I would imagine. Yeah, the ground speed is a function of the, of the salt, <laughs> believe it or not. Yep. This year we ran uh, to run almost the same speed we ran in 20, 2013, which is the last time we ran that engine combination. Uh, it took quite a bit more power to make up for the lack of traction. The salt was kind of mushy. So instead of actually spinning the tire and leaving black marks on the salt, it was just throwing a rooster tail of salt. So we basically probably had 300 more horsepower to run slightly faster than we did when we had good traction. And, uh, you know, the goal is always, everybody always holds their breath, hoping that the weather and everything cooperates and the, and the conditions improve. And uh, I'm not sure they ever will be as good as they were, you know, a few years ago. But uh, we just plan on making more horsepower every year, see how fast we can go. That's all you can do, make more power. Well, Kenny did say it's an open forum. So I got some questions. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> um, I, there was some discussion, and I believe Tom can probably probably remember back when we were talking about it. We were talking about uh, rod-to-stroke relationship in engines with more volatile mixtures, like yep. uh, nitrous, like nitrous high engines. boost. Yeah, yeah. Do you have any insight into rod-to-stroke relationship or... You know, because I remember we always joke about it. Like when Jenkins was asked about it, he says it connects the piston and the rod, <laughs> and he really didn't care. Yep. Yeah, it pretty much does. Although, you know, we've kind of been through everything from like a 140 something rod ratio up to a 2.2. And, uh, you know, the, the turbocharged engines, I like, I like a, a fairly long rod ratio if it's not as expensive a long rod. So we try to build everything really short on the stroke. And then the rod itself is, well, as an example, uh, the engine that we ran this year has a 3.4 stroke and a 6-inch rod. So it's it's not real good, but the little engine, the 300-inch motor, has a 2.15 rod ratio. And the reason I like that is because it, the if you look at the relationship of the piston to the crank pin as it's going down, uh, you get to a point where you're pushing out more than down on those short rod deals. So there probably is a point in time in there where there's, you know, you're losing a little bit of power and friction and stuff like that and, and not being able to drive as hard on the crank pin. But we've run them, like I say, we've run them all over the place. We ran the Buicks for a long time with a six and a half inch rod with a 
three and five eight stroke. And then we ran some stuff that ran really good with a six inch rod too. So it's really hard to pin it down. Uh, I just look at how bad you uh, how bad you can rock the piston over going down. Uh, one of the things that that does come up is with the long rod ratio engines, uh, you can comfortably run more timing, which we're kind of prone to doing anyway. And uh, and as a result, you do need the the more timing because that piston's coming in PDC pretty fast, and then it accelerates away kind of slow. So it's just the opposite of the short rod deal. But uh, there'll be four or five degrees more timing that you'll put in a long rod versus a short rod. Well, it's funny because the same thing. one of the things, All you're doing is yeah, one of the guys getting that, that peak pressure about ten to fifteen after TDC, and uh, and then if you, I guess, if you subscribe to a theory, the long rod will expose the the piston to a, a more compact chamber volume for a little bit longer, maybe to get a little bit more push, but who knows? Yeah, because uh, the the thing that I had you know been interested by is somebody was saying that if the mixture is extremely volatile and and prone to a problem which, you know, I guess you could always have, I mean, how many band-aids are you going to build in? But the piston with the with the shorter rod would tend to run away and and give you a little more window of cushion. I mean, like, this is, that's why, like, I, I had a conversation with a couple of friends of mine uh, back and forth about exactly this, and I, I don't know if it's 100% cut and dry. I, I don't, it's a I really tough thing to answer. A lot of variables involved. I don't yeah. know if it's cut and dry either. Yeah. It's, it, you know, it's, I can tell you one thing, when you think the engine's not in detonation and you're running high boost and you pull the pan and look at the connecting rod and it's bent, and then you look at the weight of the rod and you think, well, gee, that's a fairly heavy rod. You know, we were starting to bend this, the stuff around 800 grams and that's a six inch rod. So basically we're in big block rod weight territory, but we were literally bending the rod. And uh, so we just kept making them heavier now our current rods weigh 880 grams and they're six and a quarter inches long and uh that stopped the bending but i think what was happening was like you talk about the detonation thing Mm -hmm. there's probably a point where it rattles a little bit and with the cylinder pressures in that 3,000 pound per square inch area and all of a sudden uh, a little bit of detonation here up in the 4,000 pound per square inch area so if you have a a rod that's the least bit weak in the beam area it's going to bend it Mm -hmm. And, uh, it's, it's kind of factual actually. What, what, what do you run, uh, man, that's a heavy rod and the RPM you're talking about and the, and the cylinder pressure. If, if, you, if I can ask, what do you run for, uh, for rod bearing clearance and oil pressure? That's a good one, Thomas. Oh, it, you don't always have a choice, but, um, usually somewhere between two and a half and three and a half thousand. Okay, that, that's yeah. where I would have thought it would have had been over over three. The crowd is happy. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, sometimes it is. You know, sometimes you just simply can't get there from here. Yep. And I'm not a real nut on what the number is because we've ran them. Uh, if, a few years ago, we were running one of those Buicks, and it was my own engine, and ended up with about four and a half thousand on the mains, but I had to run it anyway. Yep. Yep. And I really didn't see any any downside <laughs> to it. We still had good oil pressure, but. Uh, we run 130 pounds of oil pressure pretty pretty typically, and we run. And that, I'm sure you uh, need it. Been running 20, 2050 Lucas synthetic, and then they they have another. They had a 50 weight that we ran this year, and the 50 weight seemed to provide uh, maybe even a little bit better oil pressure uh, after about a three quarters of a minute of runtime on those engines. <laughs> we also run that same oil in the Pro Mod because it seems like they've got a blend there. Maybe if the alcohol doesn't mix quite so easily with it yeah so uh, quick yep but i am a big fan of a lot of oil pressure uh, so well generally everything we run is well over 100 pounds yeah well when you have that kind of clearance you kind of have to have it well and you got you got to look at the cylinder pressure you know because like yep. I say, uh, if you do the math on it it's in the three thousand pound per square inch range whereas a you know maybe a uh pro stock motor might be 1900 to 2000 pounds so you're you know you're you're up in that Area, if you look at the brake mean effective pressure, which is a, it's kind of a, it's a, it's a, it's a not an absolute, but it, what it is is a measure of displacement and torque. And if we had a, a, a typical good performing engine like a pro stock motor, it made it about, oh, 2.4, 2.5 on the 
BMEP, and we're over six, maybe almost seven on on a num on the number value. So, you know, you're really elevating the cylinder pressure is what it comes down to. So you that oil uh, cushion is is very valuable. The film strength of the oil and and if you're running two or three thousandths, uh, and maybe as much as four, you can. You got to watch the of all things. You've got to watch the cam bearing clearance because it's usually worse if you're not if you're not running needle bearing or roller bearing cam bearing. Then your cam bearing clearance becomes a uh, big player in this this whole value of bearing clearances because almost all the engines feed the cam bearing directly off the oil fed to the main. Yep. And uh, some of these LS combinations that we have have four to five thousand cam bearing clearance, and you can see an effect on you know by which end you put the oil in. If you put it in the rear, but you look at the front main. If you put it in the front, you look at the rear main, and you'll see that the bleed off around the cam journals by the time it gets to that last main, it has an effect on the oil supply to that rear main. So yeah, it becomes uh, detrimental. Oh yeah. You, uh, we'd really like to run roller bearings with a lot of these things, but on the small blocks, it, it became almost impossible with the lifter bank layout that we had where we had a, a half inch wide opportunity, even with the just lifter. And then the roller bearing was 740,000 wide. So you just couldn't do it. Yeah. But, but you could do it on one and five, and so we did that, and that really seemed to work just fine. And then when we didn't do it, we had one that dried up the rear main. So, uh, and it, it, you know, at that point, I don't think clearances or oil pressure or anything can do much because you just you're just bleeding oil off as it goes to the rear. And the, uh, the 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 goal is not to have enough oil to, at each end of the motor, and uh, the small block stuff uh, that's pretty easy because they have oil entry front and rear but on the as it turns out on this uh this new ls engine they put the oil in the back and there's no way to put oil you know to run a jumper to the front or something so you you really have to pay attention to those clearances there it's kind of funny like talking about all this like with the oil clearance and the oil weights and everything like when you're talking to a guy who's used to doing like normally aspirated drag race stuff, they're like 50 weight oil and like you're holding up the cross. Like, Oh my God, what's wrong with you? Yeah. <laughs> you know I mean? But yeah. I think when you're, when you're into these things, you know, it, at the power levels and, and cylinder pressures that we're talking about, I mean, all bets are off. Everything changes. You got to keep steel off of steel, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's crazy. Well, yeah. You know, um, it's just, yeah, it's just kind of hard to say, you know, it's, I'd like to think that we could run by, well, I, I I guess in a way, you got one thing I didn't introduce into that conversation is there's enough twist going on in the crankshaft that uh, you've got to have a fair amount of clearance down through that crank tunnel because it's it's bending the hell out of that crank. Yeah, that too. Yep. And it it wasn't until we did this dart LS thing that we went to a, a two and three quarter inch main, which is basically a big block main size. It's a 351 Ford Cleveland bearing, but that big a main and the and the and a not not so much like a four inch stroke, you have a really good overlap. And what we saw on this engine when we took it apart the other day was absolutely no whipping of the crankshaft on the center. Uh, well, usually two starts to show some shiny spots. Three, you'll rub the black off the bearing if you have the coated bearing, mm -hmm. and four will look a little bit bad. This engine had nothing. It was it was good. So uh, you can improve on the bearing, which you see in the bearing, just by the, can the crank integrity. And one thing that isn't often brought up, but if you use a, like a Clevite H bearing, for example, it's almost fully a fully rounded bearing. It might be a, a thousandth of the parting line, maybe. If you run a P bearing or some of the other bearings, which are more eccentric, they're almost shaped like a football. You'll have two to three thousandths, four thousandths more clearance at the parting line and you will vertically. So when you're talking about clearances, you've got to qualify which bearing you're talking about the clearances on. Mm -hmm. Because the rounded bearing, obviously, uh, well, you'd have a you could have a greater number of clearance to equal the same amount of oil flow through the bearing as you would with the, the eccentric bearing. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know if that means a whole hell of a lot again. I mean, if you're in the drag racing, um, most of these things are meaningless anyway because the engines run for such a short period of time. <laughs> compared to 110 seconds yeah. oh my <laughs> god yeah that still makes me think i mean that's 
that's uh, under that kind of loading. And I mean, the RPM window that it runs in, my God. Well, I always remember you in front of the dyno for seven seconds and I couldn't imagine you holding it down for a minute and, you know, well, when I was, a minute and 50 when seconds. I was speaking with Kenny the other day, I was talking about, I had a dyno, a motorcycle motor for the guy, Danny, the, it was a 600 CC motorcycle thing. Yep. And, you know, he wanted to do a pull from like, I don't know, cause it was a, for, a, you know, a circle track thing, little tiny cars. And he wanted to do a pull from like four to like, I don't know, 16 or something. And it was insane. And I, I'm, I'm like holding the stick forward and like ducking yeah. because it's just not something yeah. you're used to doing. Yeah. Ooh. <laughs> and that was probably oh, only yeah. 15 seconds. Yeah. It was not like that. <laughs> I had one of my customer engine, a Bono, another Bonneville engine again, and it was a 255 inch uh, Chevy with an 8200 deck, and it was it was designed to run 10,000. Or we plan on it. We never quite make power up that high. We got power up in the middle nines, but uh, I on my dyno I can actually program it to run uh, the gear simulation deal. It sounds as though it's got a transmission on it. So I kind of laid out the, the values on the on the program to where uh, each gear would be long enough that after about a minute and a half, it would be uh, at some point down the course, not probably not five miles, but so it was a five speed. So it would I'd run it to ninety five hundred, and it would make a gear change and drop to about uh, eight thousand somewhere in that area, and then back up. And this is all spread out over time. So these gears sound like you're in this gear forever. And um, to stand there and watch that thing for that long on the dyno, it got so bad on one run, I actually pulled the throttle back a little bit, and then you could hear the engine hunting. And then when we replayed the thing, it sounded like it was spinning the tire. It was kind of, <laughs> kind of interesting, but it, uh, it was just me getting getting a little stupid on that because I I was I couldn't wait till that thing hit about 9,400 or fifth gear, and 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 then it just shuts down, you know, and you're done, and then, so I did two of those back to back, and then I went out and pulled the valve covers and the fixes we'd put in. The rocker stands were still, the rocker bar was still bolted down, still had valve lash. Everything looked good, and at that point it became something we could ship. But uh, you know, it's, it's it's pretty torturous to, to to do that if you could just push a button and walk away and come back after it's done. It wouldn't be so bad. <laughs> and and I, I've had this discussion with customers that like, I mean, maybe this is the ignorance is bliss thing. Like they don't know anything. Like if a customer was watching you dyno a motor and you made a long pull, like they're like up their faces in the window. They're like not yeah. even. And you know, people said, well, are you not confident in the stuff you build? And I'm like, do you realize what's going on there? I mean, do, do you really like all the parts that are working together? Stuff happens. It's just, I don't know, man. It's it's really frustrating for me. I can't, I couldn't even think yeah, about doing a test like that. The, the thing we've had to, to, to change in the way we test the turbocharged engines in particular is with the advent of really good electronic boost control. Uh, in the old days, we'd just dial up a boost number and then the thing would go to, you know, 30 pounds of boost at 5,000 or something and just, by the time it got to seven or eight thousand, it's either shoved a head gasket or done something stupid. So uh, now we actually bring the boost in right at the end, so we just get a peak number, and uh, and then sometimes we'll run an intermediate pull or something, you know, to get a kind of fill in the gap on the numbers. But uh, the the thing that that a dyno that a dyno does is it does what it's told. So, uh, like for example, we're sleeping at six hundred RPMs a second. That's as fast as it's going to let the engine accelerate. Now you've got a boosted engine at 40, 50 pounds of boost that wants to really accelerate at two or 3,000 RPMs a second, but it's held to that 600 number, and it just absolutely tortures every component in the engine. Yeah. So the, uh, the thing is you almost would like to have a dynamometer, which would, would let it spin the tires, I guess would be a, the proper term you know, or something, or slip the clutch or slip the converter, but it, it doesn't. It's just a one-to-one -one deal, and it is so hard on them that uh, the day of producing these these big, big horsepower numbers is history. I mean, uh, that 2662 on that one engine at 55 pounds would have probably been 28 or 2900, but it would have been a one-shot deal. Yeah. And uh, you'd be rebuilding it after you pulled off the dyno, so. Uh, <laughs> if it doesn't rebuild itself. <laughs> 
Well, yeah, they don't heal. That's the no. bad part of those things. Yeah. They do not. That noise never seems to go away once it starts. Well, I got a couple yeah. questions from listeners. <clears throat> um, okay. It, at one point, uh, a few shows back, we had Billy Godbold on from Comp, and a guy asked an interesting question. Uh, big block or small block size like camshaft? I imagine he was talking about journal size. Like, do you find that in these things, stability, stability? I mean, doesn't matter what you're running it in? Oh, we, we just run big cam journal stuff in all of them. Okay. That's one of the advantages of like a Dart Iron Eagle or even that new Dart uh, LS Next block. You can pretty much put any cam bearing size in that you want. Mm -hmm. And uh, we run kind of settled on 55 millimeter Babbitt because uh, of the low bliss we're running is about 530,000. And so a 55 millimeter journal is actually not too bad at that point. We've run some 60 millimeter stuff. And, uh, but at the same time, we were still running, uh, 500 thousandths lift or somewhere in that area. Because our, our, our total lift is on these engines is somewhere between 840 and 900,000. So, uh, but the bigger, the, the bigger the cam journal, the bigger the core, the stronger the camshaft. I mean, it's just, when you look at a small block Chevy cam with the, the little, in fact, I'm not even sure what the size of that cam journal on those things now, but it's it's tiny compared to like a 60, and you and the core is only 900,000 thick, and then you get this 60 millimeter thing, and the core is an inch and a half thick. Mm -hmm. uh, there's just a lot to be said for for that part of that technology in the camshaft. Okay, and let's uh, let's just touch on camshafts real quick because we talked about this. That you know we. What, could you explain to some of the listeners what a quote unquote turbo cam is? <laughs> that would be good. Yeah, we, 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 we kind of jokingly laughed about that one the other day. It's any camshaft you put in the engine. And uh, yep. it's uh, back, I think there was some mystique when, when turbochargers first came into play with, and I, I think it all started with the carbureted uh, boat engine stuff. And everybody assumed that the, that a turbo cam had to have a short exhaust timing and a, and a longer intake timing. And uh, not knowing any different, we actually kind of subscribed to that early on. And then one time Crane made us a cam for one of our Buicks and they flipped them around. They, they added 10 or 12 degrees to the exhaust. And boy, that was a pleasant gain. So uh, we kind of picked up on, the, on that bit of information. And now we what we do is we, we just run really smooth profiles. It could be a, a for a long time we were running uh, comps short track stuff, cams that they would normally run on like on a in a truck or something on a on a short track, and they were pretty smooth and because they had to run a higher RPM a lot. And uh, so we stuck with the smooth profiles because the the more abrupt profiles did nothing but introduce valve float and uh, the. Uh, Springs like the softer, the smoother cams, even though we still put a fair amount of lift in them. But at the end of the day, what you really want to do with a turbocharged motor is you want to get that exhaust valve open as far as you can by the time the piston reaches bottom dead center because it's going to go up and it's going to push through the exhaust valve open area. So if you run a short timing one or you run a close low center cam, you've got a piston doing a lot of work on the exhaust stroke. So by spreading the load separation out, the biggest advantage of the wide load center is it just gets the exhaust valve open further before bottom dead center. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's, the pumping losses go right down as, as you do that. And the thought about load separation on boosted engines, they figured you know that that you didn't need that overlap period that you would have with a normally aspirated engine, uh, which you know a good a good normally aspirated engine has got to have. 60 plus degrees of overlap at 50. Uh, our boosted stuff is somewhere in the high 30s or 40 degrees at 50. And uh, the advent of new turbochargers with the back pressure signature reduced significantly. I mean, we've gone from 40 pounds of boost and 70 pounds of back pressure to well, currently, we, right now, we're, we can be at 55 pounds of boost and, and 36 or 37 pounds of back pressure. Once that happened, the lobe separation period become way less important because uh, the high back pressure stuff would fill the intake runner a little soot. I mean, it looked like a like a furnace inside. Now we've got these 
new generation of turbos, and uh, you never see any incidents of the the darkening of the intake runner from reversions, so, especially on, when that exhaust valve. Well, when you have 60, 70 pounds of back pressure and on and overlap, that would actually move up the intake runner as a form of EGR, just like an EGR valve. Mm-hmm. And uh, now that we've gotten away from that, obviously, uh, even the power production becomes better because of the lack of EGR. Well, that's uh, that's really good. I never thought about that, the back pressure changing what you would do with the camshaft. And that would be a function of, of what you have from the turbo side. Yep. That's really, well, you know, boy, that sure kind of puts a damper on everybody who has the idea of a quote unquote turbo cam. Yeah, turbo cam. <laughs> because <laughs> no, we get we get phone calls all the time about a guy wanting to wants to pick a, a, a grind for a turbocharged deal, and uh, it basically the criteria is it's got to be smooth, and it doesn't have to be uh, on a hundred and eight or ten load center. It can be you know one hundred fourteen or fifteen. It'll be just fine. I built, I think I might have discussed this, I built three Buick HCV6s that were, two went to the UAE and one of them we had in, the, in our drag race car. And cam core selection was pretty sporadic. So I think, uh, I remember one of the cams was 112 volt separation. We had one of 114. And then I did a round core for the engine that we ran in our car. And it was on 118 volt center. And then they all got run across the dyno in a period of about, uh, three weeks and all had the same 76 millimeter turbos and uh so pretty much the equation was very much identical and they were all within 15 or 20 horsepower so uh if you were looking for a peak horsepower number it wasn't going to be found in the uh in the lobe separation and uh the interesting thing is on, on the streamliner engines the 300 inch is I think that cam's 270, 277, 283, or 285. It's actually the biggest of the three engines. And it was because of the availability of cam cores at the time we chose the cam. So, uh, you know, you would think that, that that one would take a 10 or 20 degree smaller cam, but in the actuality of it didn't make a bit of difference. And then you start looking at another dealer. You look at when the intake valve is truly closed, is the pistons coming up? No matter what the stroke is or what the separation angle is, that at that point everything gets pretty pretty close to the same numbers. And I don't know if I didn't make a career out of checking all those, but we did look at a few of them just to see what the like a two point eight stroke would be versus a four inch stroke, and uh, not a heck of a lot of difference. See on but, on that uh, on that actual event when you know, you're talking pressure that you can generate, obviously. Uh, the closer lobe center stuff generates more cylinder pressure. At the end of the day, that's the last thing we need to do because we're going to generate that with manifold pressure. So uh, go ahead and go to a wider lobe center and uh, close the intake later. Or, I mean, start the intake. Yeah, close the intake later. Yeah, because that's, that's the last thing you need to worry about, a cylinder I'll pressure. Right earlier. You got more time. You have a close lobe center gives you more time for compression. A wide lobe center gives you less time for compression. So. Uh, then you just double or triple it with boost. And I guess like that, that event window, like the way that we always used to look at a lot of the normally aspirated stuff, when we're talking about the absolute event, um, you could be talking about valve on seat, you know, valve at five, valve at 50, you know, where does things start to move? And I imagine that if you're in the environment that you've got 40 pounds on the intake side, that that actual absolute event occurs pretty pretty quickly well you know billy billy Godbolt pointed out something interesting you know we're uh, a lot of people kind of dwelled on the fact that if you put 40 or 50 pounds of pressure against a, a two and a quarter inch intake for example or something that is trying to blow it off the seat but he said you got to think about the other half of the equation there's all kinds of cylinder pressure and they're trying to blow it shut sure so uh i think when we were dealing with really really bad valve springs a bunch of years ago uh, it was more important to have good valve springs with the boosted engines. But today, uh, these engines that were running well in the mid 9,000 range, and I had a, a 300 inch normally aspirated one of these finished, we run a, the 1356 pack spring, which is 300 on the seat. And it's about, uh, 
pretty good spring rate. It'll be about 980 open. But when you look at that compared to the abrupt profile cams that uh, you would see in comp or pro stock, they're running 1,300 pounds or better open pressure to put that thing back on the seat again. So uh, the fact that our cams literally start to come off the seat, if you look at the on, on the cam profile, they bump off the seat fairly early, and then they kind of gradually take off as opposed to being parked and then just go vertical. Mm -hmm. And uh, part of that technology is to improve the valve to piston clearance on those normally aspirated motors. And I mean, heck, our stuff's got a 150,000 valve piston clearance typically, so it's not a not even an issue. And uh, it just comes down to any any camshaft with a good turbo will make a lot of horsepower and uh, a lot of times, uh, I think the, my thought on the cams that we run in some of these engines is based more on RPMs it's going to operate at um, than it is anything else. I mean, you know, we want something that's smooth at high RPM. Uh, if you put a short duration cam in it, you probably would not be able to buzz it as high. So uh, one of the things that the turbocharged engines really, really like is a lot of RPMs because we typically put turbos on them and they're way too big. And if you clip it off at seven or 7,500, there's still probably 30% of their airflow is not even being used yet. So, um, you know, if you run them up in the 9,000 RPM range and you take advantage of the amount of air that turbocharger will move. Okay. Got it. What about, um, if I could ask, uh, how fussy are they on, uh, on headers? Another one of our our listeners. Uh, um, does it does it matter um, much? Uh, your headers, you know. It, I suppose in an ideal world, if you get all of them about uh, fifteen, sixteen inches long, and uh, and a good collector, that would be probably about as good as it needs to be. But uh, we're typically building the header lengths based on what it takes to collect the pipes, and so now that that puts us in the twenty four, twenty five inch range on our tubes because. Once you go into positive pressure, uh, you're not using any reversion to pull an intake charge because the intake charge is already in the pressure. Uh, you know, we got 14 and a half pounds of atmospheric pressure, but then when you go three or four times that, you're not really relying on, on a cycle event. You're just basically blowing it through. And uh, we built headers that were what we call a shotgun style where the front one was 12 inches long and the last one was 24 inches long and they just kind of each you know they just all four different lengths and uh, they would pull the turbo up pretty good we've gone to great extremes on these high horsepower stuff to try to keep them within a couple inches of each other which i think is just proper thinking but uh we did a on a, we had a small block a few years ago that ran uh, competitive and comp and actually had a little foray into pro stock uh, we had two inch primaries on it, and so we thought, let's try two and a quarter inch. So we went to two and a quarter inch, and uh, essentially the car ran the same. Hmm. So uh, we'd like to have thought that by opening up the, the pipe, we'd reduce some of that heat and friction. But uh, one thing that, a little side note on this thing, one thing that spins a turbo is one of the factors is heat. As you, the more you can expand the exhaust gas, the more it'll faster it'll spin the turbo. And uh, we found that alcohol, when we pour the huge masses of alcohol through the engine, part of that's still going out into the pipe. And uh, the the net result is, all things being equal, uh, the engine switched to methanol will actually spool quicker than it does on gasoline. Okay. A lot of questions are flying in. Um. May, well, actually, these both of these questions I think you touched on earlier. Um, one guy wanted to know your opinion on carbureted turbocharging in a Bonneville application. And I thought you said that 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 was pretty tough, right? I wouldn't. I wouldn't do it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You said that earlier. Uh, it, it needs to be injected and in, yeah. To, to, well, to you got you, it, it. There's no predictability as to which cylinders get the most fuel. Obviously, right. You know because uh, of that, you can if you're blowing through it or drawing through it. And uh, so it's a crapshoot with a carburetor. You know, look at the cost of a good carburetor versus a cheap fuel injection system. It's 
not much different. Yeah, yeah. we uh, Kenny and I talked about that the other day. We talked about the fuel injection side and what the people like where they came from. Did they like in their mind associate what they're doing in the computer with a power valve or an accelerator pump, or, or are they guys that don't really understand? <laughs> you know, it's like translating a different language. Yep. Like which way you learned it. Yep. Yeah. Well, oh. if, you, if you have a pretty good understanding of the carburetors and the, how the air bleeds and the emulsion channels and all that stuff works, it's real easy to, well, in fact, you think you've really found the ideal combination with the, with the injection because now you're not out there changing the high-speed air bleed and putting a bigger main jet in or doing something like that. You just go to the keyboard and make a few little changes and you can make changes in, you know, in the actual fuel delivery or, or in a trim change or anything. But it, essentially what you can do is when you get that fuel injection system working really, really good, it's like a really good carburetor. I mean, in terms of uh, how smart it is, because a carburetor is extremely smart, especially yeah. in a normally aspirated uh, condition. Yep. And a fuel injection system is just dumb as dirt until you program it. So yep. uh, when you emulate the carburetor, you've got a really good package. Obviously, boosted is a whole different story because, you know, carburetors don't work well with massive amounts of air blowing through them. No, no. Um, the other big question we've had, and I've had this myself, um, compression ratio, because I deal with this on a daily basis, uh, you know, selling pistons and stuff. Uh, what do you prefer? I mean, is there a target compression ratio for something that's got a lot, gets a lot of boost or does boost uh, affect it? Uh, you know, we hear 10 I to think, 1. 11. Yeah, it's probably one of the best questions to be asked because what uh, what you're trying to achieve if you need to have some knowns, like, for example, you need to know uh, how much horsepower you're you're going to make. You know, is it going to be four or five horsepower per cubic inch, something in that area? And then, at, and, you know, uh, I don't want to stumble on this, but let's just say, uh, use some analogies. So let's say we build a 9-to-1 compression engine and run 50 pounds of boost on it. Uh, you got uh, there's a timing signature that's associated with the cylinder pressure that goes with the static compression. So at nine to one, we probably run 21, 22 degrees ideally at that boost level. Uh, if we were to drop it back to say three degrees, we would probably take 60 or 70 horsepower out of it. So the the most timing you can run out of detonation or the closer you can get it to what it would be normally aspirated, if the engine is makes good power at 30 degrees normally aspirated at 14 to one, then at 15 pounds of boost, you'll have the same number. And as the boost goes up, you'll obviously pull it back. But the worst thing that can happen if you have too high a static compression, you will end up with a very low amount of timing. Uh, you'll lose more horsepower in the timing than you will gain in the compression. So okay. uh, ideally, on most of these things where we're trying to plug in a big number like that, uh, endurance-wise, I guess if you could call what some of these engines are, that number is about 9.5, 9.8 to 1. Uh, mm -hmm. Now you trip over into, say, Pro Mod, where you don't have a boost limitation. And now you'll be somewhere around 11 to 1. seems to be uh, a very safe spot to be. Yep. You still can run a pretty pretty good timing signature. And then NHRA will come along and put a 35-pound boost limit on it. Well, now you just raise the compression to 11 to 1 or 12 to 1. And you'll make up the power you lost. Uh, the engine will be a little more edgy because... You still want to run as much time as you can. So, uh, you know, the chances of hurting one of them is a little greater. But uh, I think I think the GM guys pretty much figured it out when they had about nine and a half to one compression on their uh, boosted engines, uh, like the, the Corvette and the Cadillac stuff. Uh, the And you guys sell a lot of those nine to one and 11 to one piston packages. And oh, yeah. The, the, uh, ironically, some engines will tolerate a fair amount of boost, even 11 to 1. Yeah, but, well, also, the, the like, cylinder head has, has a bunch to do with it also, right? Well, especially like it's a Coyote with a four-valve head. Yeah. Uh, for some reason, those things have an immunity to detonation. I I simply don't understand it, but they do. When we do the GMLS motors, if we run, when we're running, uh, especially when we're running pump gas with uh, some of the earlier roots blown stuff, if they were ten seven to one on the compression, and we were at say twelve or thirteen pounds of boost, we could be down around twelve degrees of timing, and and we could take that same engine and drop it to nine and a half to one compression, 
and go right to 22 degrees on the timing. Well, you picked up 10 horsepower every degree. Mm-hmm. So the, that made the nine and a half to one or the nine to one compression stuff look really, really good. Yep. And, uh, and then if you put race gas in those nine and a half to one compression engines, we could run 30 degrees at 20 pounds of boost. Mm-hmm. So on, on a good fuel. So it's, uh, really, it's kind of a, a bunch of things enter into the picture. I mean, the big block Chevy head with a, with a big chamber simply needs a lot more timing at the same compression. And, and what none of these engines need is eight to one compression. We tried that. And, uh, I think I built one one time at seven point eight to one, and it would barely turn the dyno. Yeah, just, mm-hmm. no matter it's what. Terrible. We, yeah, it didn't make enough energy to spin the turbo, basically. So, and no amount of timing fixed it. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, it's it's kind of what what you get, what environment you get stuck in. If you're getting stuck in a in a class legal deal, uh, where you have a certain size turbo and it may be a little bit marginal in terms of power production. You're going to want to push the compression envelope as much as you can. I mean, it could be 11, 12 to 1 in some instances. See, if I, you have an open architecture, uh, you can you can safely pull that number back. See, I, I've always heard it equated to, I mean, when people talk about this, that, you know, the point of diminishing, diminishing return when you've got a normally aspirated engine. As you come up in compression, you're going to get to the point, like we always used to say, like from 9 to 10 was worth like maybe 15, you know, 12, 15. Like everybody's got a number that they put on it. but going from 14 to 15 is it going to be worth 15 is it is it does it kind of work like that like your diminishing return if you're like boost versus compression well basically just boost versus boost is an interesting diminishing return because if you have a turbo that's rated at oh it's it's, pick a number say it's rated 100 pounds per minute it's basically 10 times that is a thousand horsepower. So you might make uh, 800 at a fairly nominal boost number. Let's give it a number 25 pounds. You might go to 30 pounds and 35 pounds, and you might pick up a little bit. You know, might pick up another 100 or so. But the, the, the amount of power you gain per pound of boost once you ca- go past that nominal midpoint mm-hmm. goes way down. And on the roots blower stuff we tested, we could go from, say, 15 to 18 pounds, and all we would pick up is torque. The actual peak horsepower never changed because it was a limited displacement device, and it can only produce maybe 80 pounds of air per minute. So the faster you spun it, you just got your 80 pounds, but you got it at a lower RPM. Got it. So, uh, a lot of times that's what happens. In any, any of those pressurized devices, you know, they only can produce they can only put in the engine what they what they are capable of producing in pounds per minute so you know you can't fool the technology you can't make 1300 horsepower with a 90 pound per minute device because it just won't go there and it'll make much difference how big the engine is because all the air goes through that device so uh, the that's where the advent of all these bigger and bigger and bigger bigger turbos are coming in is because the you can't take a uh, an 88 millimeter turbo and put it on a 600 inch motor and expect it to make peak power. But you can put a 98 on there and make big power. Uh, you might put the 98 on the 500 inch motor and it might not be nearly as impressive. But uh, the the more air it'll supply, the greater the gains are early on. We'll pick up pick up in some areas there probably between say 15 and 20 pounds of boost. It's not uncommon to pick up almost 100 horsepower per pound. Wow. There's a sweet spot in there where the numbers just go nuts. But then as you continue to go up and getting up there near the end, like uh, the difference between 50, I'll say the difference between 45 and 55 pounds on one of these engines we have is, is not a huge amount of horsepower. Mm-hmm. It's not nearly as big a gain as it would be if you were going from 15 to 25. And uh, because you're simply running out of the capacity of the device itself. Kenny, I got a, I have a little bit of a long-winded question for you. Um, you know, you mentioned the uh, the new Dart Pro Stock 10 degree head, and I just looked at a picture of it. I'd seen it before. It's got a big oval port intake uh, runner in it, 368 cc's of volume. Um, it, if you, it, do you is there a scenario where if you're building, uh, I don't want to say unlimited, but you have a power package that you need to make. Let's say it's um. 
350 cubic inches and 1500 wheel horsepower. Um, is there a scenario that you could imagine running a smaller valve than, uh, take two heads and one has a, a two inch intake and one has a two 100 intake and one has a, a, a 300 CC intake and the other has a 325 CC intake. Is there a reason why you would run something smaller? Uh, strictly yeah, that power level. Yeah, you, you really can. Uh, I'll give you a good example. Uh, we used to build these uh, 274 inch Buick V6s, and we built some with where we had the uh, we modified the heck out of the production head, and then we had uh, the stage two head, which you know, literally flowed almost 100 CFM more. So I had two of those 274s on the dyno. Uh, one had, and they both had the 76 turbos on them. The one with the, with the small port volume, not very good flow and head. Uh, it made peak power at 4,800 RPMs, and it made peak torque right in that area too. So it was about 800 and 800. Put the the other 274 on it with the free flowing heads, and it was down almost 300 foot pounds of torque in that area. But it ran right out to 7,000, and then it was up four or five hundred. So uh, it's just like a, a it's almost like it's normally aspirated at that point you know the small port head small valve does really well in the lower rpm ranges the better flowing heads do really well in the higher rpm ranges and uh one of the things that that i have found that's probably a little bit beneficial is we shrink the exhaust valve size on these boosted engines and uh typically you'd think you'd want to run the biggest exhaust valve you could put in it but what we found is the bigger the valve and uh the fact that it's not a hemi, so the valve valve is shrouded against the combustion chamber wall, the outflow around the exhaust valve tends to want to bend the valve, and it'll actually rub the side of the combustion chamber. So uh, by utilizing a smaller valve head and essentially the same port throat area underneath it and just giving it more lift and duration uh, makes it uh, a little more viable package. So you just keep it off the, and, off the uh, cylinder? Pardon me? So it just keeps it off the cylinder, actually. Yeah, it, and, and you know, I guess a, a, another way of looking at it is, you know, if the exhaust gases have to move around the head of the valve to go into the bowl area and escape out of the port, you know, the bigger the bigger the obstruction you put on there, it's like a big door versus a small door, I guess, in that area. I mean, you're going to... So this is on the exhaust. Pull. Yeah, which is... On the exhaust side, yeah. Opposite of what, what's his name was what, saying. What about the intake side? Uh, have you seen anything from uh, smaller valve? Well, it's hard to say. Uh, Once it's pressurized, I would argue that. Yeah, it it's, it's probably not a lot of difference. The, yeah. uh, the thing, uh, the intake side of the engine under boost is is probably a little less critical. Uh, the exhaust side is kind of critical in that you want to get the exhaust gases out as easily as you can uh, without forcing it to go back through the intake valve on the overlap stroke, but. Uh, most of the stuff we have had good success on the power with so on, on a small block will have a, oh, a 2230 intake or something like that. Uh, that new dart head's a 2300 intake. And, yep. and actually, uh, on the next grouping I get, I'm going to actually shrink that back to about 2250 because what it does is it moves the exhaust valve pretty close to the, to the center divider. You know, in other words, that dimension between the two cylinders uh, typically is about 290 thousandths, but when you get that big valve in there and, and a fairly big exhaust valve, that dimension gets reduced down to about 220 thousandths, and it makes it really tough for us to uh, double O-ring that thing and if we run on the copper head gasket. So uh, I'd, I'd almost trade a little bit of the valve size, and, and if I had to, I'd just make up with it for a little bit more duration or lift. Yeah. Okay. So if you had like a, a 4060 bore, LS, what would you use? Like the like, say a, what? What do those things come with? Like a two hundred fifty? Oh uh, yeah. Uh, they have a two hundred sixty five valve. Two hundred sixty five. Two hundred sixty five. And 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 I think the what's the intake one five seventy or something like that. But anyway, they're really there's nothing wrong with that valve sizing uh, because until you get into about a four and eighth bore, you you know you really and and they they do put a two one hundred intake in some of those. I don't know if they gain anything because the shrouding probably equal to gain an area yep. uh, and 
I know the Dart deal, since it's a canned valve head and it's designed for a high RPM 400 inch motor, uh, and I think the flow numbers on that thing's around 360. And uh, so it's a, you know, it's a pretty good flowing head, and it would need to be to fill 400 inches of normally aspirated engine at 10,000. So, mm-hmm. all uh, right. So, so, you know, it, sorry, I just want to just want to recap just so everybody's clear. So the smaller heads on the on the same engine made peak power earlier, but then pretty much died. And the bigger heads made, you said, three or four hundred horsepower more at seven thousand, right? Yeah, the the and the thing, the problem with small ports is you just the port velocity and and the, and the fill rate is pretty good when you have uh, you know a fair amount of time, another lower RPM, so you got more time to fill. Yep. But then they 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 deplete pretty quickly because you just simply can't pack more in. And right, I think one of the other downsides is the observed manifold pressure which people call boost is it's a function of what's left over after you've pushed all the air in the plenum into right the right it's actually so a back pressure it, number it's back pressure number yep. so you can always equate it to 100 pounds of pressure on a bike tire versus 100 pounds of pressure on a, on a truck tire there's a lot more volume but the same pressure exactly so yep. the small port and a small plenum will show an unusually high boost numbers but not necessarily high flow numbers. And uh, as you open up that restriction, in other words, make the intake port bigger, make the valve bigger, make the cam bigger, you'll actually see a, a, uh, a drop in manifold pressure, but the power goes up. Yeah, because it's getting yeah. where it needs to go. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I, one time I, I ran a 292-inch uh, Ford and a 406 Ford and one of the 270-inch Buicks. Yeah, uh, they and they were all twin turbo, and uh, as I recall, all had about the same turbo on them. And the the small V8 was showing a higher manifold pressure at the same power level. And I'm thinking back at that time, it was like four or five pounds more boost was observed on it. Uh, working pressure, you know, and the uh, the V6 it took a lot of the manifold pressure to get it to come into play because it had only six cylinders, not eight. So it didn't have the ability to, to blow down as easily. And as you, the bigger you make the engine with the same turbo, the less manifold pressure you'll see. Yep. Then that makes and sense. That's a good thing. Yep. It's a, it's a good thing really, because, uh, the, uh, I guess ideally if, if there was, if you could put that much air in it and there was no, uh, parasitic losses or, or pumping losses, power numbers would be even greater yet. Sure. Mm-hmm. And That's really interesting about the exhaust one, side. Or a Formula One motor. Yeah. So, but the exhaust side, that's the one that, And but you know, if you look at it, the top fuel valves you guys have. Yeah. I think over the, over time, they've shrunk the head diameter. Yes, also. they have. Yeah. Actually, valves in general have shrunk on the exhaust side. And it makes perfect sense, Kenny. And, and the reason we wanted to hear that, because... You know, we have people that, you know, argue everything known to man in the, in the car industry, but there were some arguments that we got involved in that just didn't make sense at all. And, uh, but no one would, would subscribe to our way of thinking, not that we're, we're the geniuses, but we just happen to know a lot of people that do what you do. So just to, to have somebody kind of confirm what we already knew is, is great on the air. Yeah. You know. When I first got involved with the with the roots blowers, the the, the Eaton rotor pack stuff like Magnuson and those guys, I can always remember Jerry Magnuson setting me down and telling me, he says, now you've got to make the exhaust valve is two inches, and the intake valve needs to be two inches. And he went on and on and on. And I So I pretty politely said, okay. So went right back work with you know just added exhaust duration and lift to the exhaust cam to make up for what you added to the intake side and he he his statement was he says i know it works but it's not right <laughs> 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 and you know it's, yeah, it's just a different way of looking at it he yeah. came from an era when they you know when they they didn't have a lot of that technology and they needed a big exhaust valve just to get the stuff out and now all of a sudden we come along with all these tricky camshafts and you know, if if you look at a at some of these GM things, I mean, they'll have uh, 
a cam that's 212 on the intake and 240 on the exhaust. Just it's just enormous separation. And I, they're they're probably playing games with other things that we don't think about, but it just shows you that you know you can you can trick the engine into making it do anything you want it to do just by manipulating these these things like cam timing and valve sizing and stuff like that. And uh, you know it's ultimately it just turns into a package, and the package kind of has to generally complement itself. It doesn't have to be absolute in any one area because there is no absolute turbo. Port volume, valve size, camshaft, header size, or any of that. It's just the sum of all that is the best you've got to deal with on that given day. I got to laugh because there's probably a whole bunch of guys right now that are looking at their turbo cam on the shelf saying, yep. man, damn. <laughs> <laughs> all the time reading internet <laughs> blogs. <laughs> I told you the other day about, about this Buick V6 that I did that had a, it made a thousand horsepower at the flywheel. It had a, 68 millimeter turbo on it, which meant it was going to make a thousand. That was it. But the camshaft, uh, due to one of my constraints, was 221 on, at 50 on the intake, 229 on the exhaust at 50. It was a hydraulic, which is just enormously small. But it made everything the turbocharger was capable of. And and the the benefit of that particular device was we had a an engine that we only ran at 7,000 RPM, so it had to be rather productive from, say, 3,000 up. Had to bring the turbo up to speed and do all these things. So here's this camshaft that's literally 20 degrees too small in, in any way of thinking, and it did just fine. But now if you put a bigger turbo on it, then it would be 20 degrees too small. Mm -hmm. So you can, you can pair them up. Uh, I had a guy in Australia one time that was doing pump gas dyno shootout deals where they put them on the dyno and just go wide open throttle and see who made the most power. And he didn't have a lot of money to spend, but he did have a lot of nitrous stuff left over. And so after we'd extended rocker ratios and all the intermediate cam profiles, he says, well, what about my nitrous cam? I says, how big is it? It was, it was huge. I forget. It was probably 290 on the intake and 310 on the exhaust or something. So he put that in there and it picked up again. <laughs> so about then I'm thinking, why bother? <laughs> you know, just, it's just pick one that fits the environment and, and run it. Yep. And that's probably the best advice you can get. Yeah. He said, he said, I think stable or something to that effect a couple of times. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you want, you want smooth profiles because smooth. what you don't want is you don't want to have to run a lot of valve spring pressure to overcome that rapid uh, acceleration ramp that you get when you get these rather peaky lobe designs. Yep. And uh, because at the end of the day, and boosted wise, you may not see any kind of a significant gain in power, and but you will see a significant gain in valve float. Wow, it's been gold. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of real good information here. Yeah. This is one that people are going to go back and listen to specifically about the technical side. <laughs> yeah, because there is a lot of good information. Well, here. yeah, the other stuff was just yeah, just kind of filling a little time slot, a little background. <laughs> but the, the technical stuff is stuff I really, I really thrive on. That's the stuff that. Uh, and, you know, if you don't get caught in conventional wisdom or reading the magazines and just think about this stuff for a little bit, some of it kind of makes sense. You know, it's, uh, it's sometimes misinformed will lead you down the wrong path. And uh, not to say that people intentionally misinform anybody. Sometimes they just don't look at the whole picture. No, and you, you got the guys that have good intentions on forums, and they say something in, in a way that looks convincing uh, well thought out his argument and all of a sudden all these people believe him and it's, it starts this, you know, trend Freight of train of wrong. Yeah. And it, it's sometimes it's hard to derail. Well, we derailed some of it tonight. Well, you know, perfect summation of that was I did a, an article with one of the magazines a few years ago. And it, I'm not sure. I don't remember which one it was, but anyway, uh, there was a misstatement in the, in the, article and a guy called me up and i said well the, the truth of the matter is it was this not that and his response was he says the magazine said it was that in other words that was the bible he wasn't going to listen to me <laughs> because even though it wasn't what we intended to print it got into print and that became the absolute so a lot of times you know don't confuse me with facts i've made up my mind and uh sometimes that applies to, to stuff that people 
assume is the correct answer. And uh, and when that's the case, you know, you just I'm fine with it. I don't argue with them, and uh, and they probably wouldn't benefit by the changes that we would have implemented anyway. So yeah, it, 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 it's all it's all good stuff. And the you know SAE journals, some of those things are pretty good, but they're kind of hard to read. And uh, some of these, that one magazine, that uh, one out of England, Ian Bamsey's magazine, that uh, iTech engine, yeah, yeah, yeah. iTech engine thing, that's got a lot of good information in it, almost too much information to absorb. And uh, but they're very, you know, they're very thorough, and it's kind of like Marlon Davis at Hard Rod Magazine. If you tell him something, he will challenge you. <laughs> to substantiate what you told him. And it's kind of cool because once it goes to print, it's going to be pretty darn accurate. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I have a real quick question for you before we lose you for the yeah. day. I was reading on okay. in Hot Rod where you were uh, working on the turbo EcoBoosts and the Mustangs and their direct injection, and you were, you were talking, it was, or they are printing a lot of horsepower. Are you using just the direct injection or are you adding another injector on the intake to feed it more well, fuel? Uh, the answer, uh, not on my end of it, but in the, in the end user end, yes, they are using, uh, they have a spacer where they put four additional injectors in. Okay. So they have port injection. Uh, but the stuff we're doing here is, is be- pretty much the baseline, and we struggle to get the correct ECU and packaging stuff to make the engine run. So we just recently received all the right parts. And, uh, but the, the direct injection one will run up to about 400, 450 horsepower before it starts, you know, getting on the fringes of, of starving, yeah. Sport, and uh, they finally figured it out. The new the new Mustang engine will be port and direct injected on the V8, and I think probably I haven't read it in print, but I believe that the four cylinder will get the same technology. And of all things, not for the reasons that you might think, it's actually to enhance the the getting rid of the deposits on the intake valve. Oh yeah. Because, because once you run a dry air intake package and you get a, an oil mist that's associated with the recycling, uh, it tends to build up on the intake valve. So by using a port injector, uh, at some point during the, the running period there, you'll actually be able to keep the valve clean. Yeah. I've seen that with Volkswagen's and Audis. Yep. So on our end though, on the hot rod end, it's just an opportunity to make a lot more power without having to worry about, uh, uh, the direct injection pump and the cam low profile and all that stuff. So at the end of the day, it's a kind of a win-win situation. Okay. That covered that for me. Cool. Uh, I'm glad you woke up, Todd. Yeah. Well, <laughs> there's, there's a lot of information coming from him, so I didn't want to interrupt, you know, it I mean, is it's good it, stuff. It's hard. And I, I, you know, Kenny, I want to like, please don't ever, you know, take offense to like moments of silence here. It's because we're all sitting here you know, hanging on every word. Oh, contemplating, you know, <laughs> you, what what he just told us. Yeah, like you, you got to, you know, like I, I said to somebody earlier, and I, I think I said at the beginning of this, that we could spend, you know, hours and hours and hours with you, and there'd always be more to talk about because there there's so much you've seen, so many, so many directions that things have gone that you can apply to, to a particular project somebody was asking you about. There There's always interconnections, and it's, it's really hard to replace that. It really is. Yeah, it, it was. Well, it's experience is the, the key player in all this stuff. You know, I mean, uh, when those guys in the UAE would ask me to for an engine, basically they just asked for an engine. So now you got to figure out the bore and the stroke and the rod ratio and will this fit and will this fit and will it run when I get done and all this stuff. And you kind of you kind of loosely end up having to design a package because it's not something canned that you buy off the shelf. So you spend three or four days just thinking about, you know, what, how big the bore. You know, the bigger the bore, the harder it is to burn, you know. Kind of, the flame front isn't as fast across the piston. If it's four seven hundred bores, it's four 500 bores. So you, all this crap goes through your mind to the point where you can't, you almost can't make a decision. And you'll come in one day and sit down and look at it and say, oh, screw it, we'll just do this and this and this. <laughs> but you, you give it the thought process and you pretty well wear yourself out on that thinking. And then you go with what you kind of figured would work anyway. Do you, uh, uh, do you go through the thought process? Like, okay, this component of this motor is like this, this component of this motor is like this. And you do like the add and subtract, like figure if I 
put this here would make me want to use this, like try to pull from past experiences? Yeah, you well, you obviously rely on experience and you rely on a few of those little unknown equations like, uh, well, if we make the damn uh, rod ratio wrong and you get up, if you get the deck too high and the rod ratio wrong, you probably have a potential to bend the rod or break the rod. So you want to avoid that. So now you're back to, well, let's put a little less stroke in it. But now if we put a bigger bore in it and it's not a, a, a pent roof or a hemi valve head, that spark plug is just getting further and further away from the center of the piston. So that means it's going to take longer for the flame front to get across. You know, And then you start thinking about the RPMs involved. And, well, we really like the RPM, this thing. I mean, it just it gets nuts. And then, then the thing about piston weight and stuff like that kind of comes into play a little bit because you're yanking a cement bucket up and down when you do that. Mm-hmm. And uh, the, the the push-pull effect comes into play. So it's... it's uh, if you could build about 50 of them, you'd probably get it right. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. Well, look, I, I know I know this, that specifically for us, uh, they're asking if you can come back again. <laughs> you know, I mean, and this is this is always a good sign. Like when a guy has a, a lot of interesting stuff to say, you know, the guys want you to come back. And, you know, it's funny. We put out there to all you guys to, to put questions up. And you didn't have a lot yeah. of questions up because you just wanted to listen. And now that we're two hours and something minutes in, yeah, now you got coming. questions. Yeah. So, <laughs> oh, Jesus. So, Kenny, can there be a next time? Well, I'll be. Yeah, you just call me. I'm game. And we'll just flip the page and start on a whole, whole new line of stories. Nice. That'll uh, work. And tech. And I'd imagine you have a couple of pages left. <laughs> I, I do. I, we haven't quite depleted the system yet. <laughs> <laughs> There's more to come. <laughs> good, good. Uh, Kenny, are you actively doing work for customers or is it just R and D? No, this is a, this is a, uh, running business. I mean, my, I jokingly refer to the R and D part of it because when you build a, a one-off engine, there's as much R and D as there is build the engine. You get paid for building the engine. You don't get paid for the R and D side of it, but the R and D side is what gives you that ability to draw all this crap out of your head. So it's kind of like a, a good deal. It's a, it's a, Regular, you know, well, almost seven day a week operation around here, mm-hmm. and uh, there's a pretty good pile of engines sitting in here to get built. And uh, every once in a while, we have a thing come along like Bonneville, which just eats up about a month of your time. And so now we're on the the catch up end of the stuff. So uh, the the R and D thing is probably a, a misnomer. It probably isn't really R and D. It's just building engines that are not mainstream and that way you you will spend a little more time evolving these things you know it's uh it's it's kind of gotten to the point where we're really used to it and you know you look at an engine and you say okay well we can put the cam sensor here and the crank sensor here so we'll make, make you make the brackets or get them machined up and you do all these little things that kind of complement the package and you always try to make them prettier and nicer so that each one looks better to the as they go out the door because Obviously, with CNC equipment, you guys are making really nice-looking components, so you don't want to hack something together and weld it up. Yeah. So uh, it's 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 kind of an interesting go-forward type of operation. But now, at the end of the day, it's just a the business, and I'm kind of selective. I get a lot of phone calls, and uh, guys will want to. They generally want something. I had a fellow call today that wanted a, a Buick V6, and I finally he wanted a lightweight all aluminum one. I and I. I kind of had to stop and have him tell me what he had budgeted for this thing because you know the, the sky's the limit when you start on this stuff you don't know what the guy wants to spend if they give you a budget then you can plan a pretty good package within his budget and then it's kind of like that's what you're going to sell it for and if it goes quickly you make a lot of money you're not a lot of money but you make money on it and then if you run into a few stumbling blocks along the way it's just you make wages but uh, either way it's it's good because uh, you never want to send something out that's not right. And uh, sometimes they'll spend a lot of time on the dyno before they go away. And uh, oiling issues and head gaskets are our biggest, that's a that's our our issue right now. And, and just briefly, uh, the LS engine with its, the way it's clamped on the block is a little, a little unique compared to what we've been used to, like with the, uh, Chevrolet Gen 1 stuff, 
And it looks like we have the capability of literally lifting the head just enough to allow the compression into the cooling system. Mm. But once it cools, once you shut it off, the pressure never leaves the cooling system. So uh, you haven't created a, a leak path into the into the coolant. What you've done is you've put combustion pressure into it, and then when you shut the engine down, it'll sit there with 25 pounds of pressure in the coolant tank for hours until you release it. But it didn't have any pressure in it when you started. So, you know, you, these are the things that, that keep your curiosity alive. And, and uh, you know, and you always figure there's a there's a fix for everything. And it most generally is if you work out long enough. Yeah, or throw enough money at, at it for sure. Um, well, Mike's point was gun, was going to be, um, you know, if, if you would like, it sounds like you don't need it, but you can um, tell everybody how to get a hold of you, your phone number, your your website, whatever it is you do to get people to call you. Well, you love this. Uh, since we're almost underground and busy, we don't even have a website. And I, I probably should. I've got all the web domains. But by the time I think about doing that, I think, wait a minute, I've got to maintain that thing. And so we there's no name on the building. It's just a, a, the, the number. Wow. And I got that from uh, Mylodon years ago. I went down to Mylodon to take some heads down there. I couldn't find the place. I drive around a block, drive around, drive around. Finally, I saw a door open. And I peeked my head in the door, and it was Mylodon's. I thought, that's pretty neat. He, here's a guy that's just <laughs> doing really good. And he doesn't have a name on the place anywhere, just just uh, whatever the, the street number was. So I kind of went with that. But they, uh, I can be uh, reached at uh, email. We, we do email all the time. And uh, it's k.weiler at gmail.com. There's just a letter K in front of my last name. Okay. So K-D-U-T-T-W-E-I-L-A-R at gmail.com. Okay. Well, hopefully... I, I hope you get some business out of, out of some of our guys, but it sounds like you're busy enough that it may not matter. Yeah, it probably wouldn't make a difference, but I, I like I like the interesting, I get interesting queries, you know, and respond to them, and uh, especially they're not really long, you know, lengthy ones. Uh, it's kind of like doing what we're doing right now, you know, and, it's, and, and honestly, what we're doing right now is this would be the compilation of about uh, four days worth of phone calls if you want to look at that where maybe a week for the phone calls if you added up all the time you spent uh, asking questions because we do get a lot of people calling with interesting questions and if I have the time I'll address the question a lot of times I don't and uh, then they get Margie and Margie's tough as nails and so <laughs> <laughs> they have to go through her to get to me but uh, I, oftentimes we just pass the information back and forth you know if I'm busy doing something I you know I better serve not stop so just relay it back and forth but uh you know they can feel free to contact me if they'd like okay fantastic well I, again kenny can't thank you enough this has been entertaining informative but, you know more than anything educational this yes. is just fantastic and ho- we're, yeah. we're hoping that we can get you back you can and it only took us two hours that's not bad yeah <laughs> no it's pretty good we got to save something for the next time yeah. Yeah, my cell phone didn't go dead, but I charged it before <laughs> just, just to make sure because I didn't know how long it would take. You know, so I was edging a bit, but it, it's been great, guys. I really enjoyed it, and I look forward to it again. All right. Thank you, Kenny. Thanks. Have a good Kenny, night. Thanks, man. You betcha. Thank you. See you. Good night, guys. Good, good night. night. I don't know what was happening with the phone there at the end. Uh, his, that, his, that might have been dying. And Maybe. It, it might be us. It, it, I, I think I wonder if that phone system in the closet's getting hot. Nah, I th- I think he might have been on the outside of his his uh, cathedral port battery. <laughs> well, I got to tell you, uh, that was everything I could have hoped for. Yeah, no doubt. And I I don't know people in the beginning of this one were like, well, you know, get to the technical stuff. But I mean, some of the background is well, oh, there's the technical stuff. What te- there's so much detailed technical stuff to go <laughs> yeah, for. How about turbo sleeper? Log the cooling system pressure and turn it down two psi. But <laughs> that's pretty good. Like like all the stuff like where he came from and and that kind of to me establishes like thought process. Yeah. Like so you figure out how the and I mean what the common thread here is that the guys that are really at the top of this game they possess one thing that a lot of people today don't have and it's logic. Yeah. They they, they solve a problem. You know, well, the old fashioned way that they did in back in the 60s, you had to figure it out logically. 
because there wasn't, there weren't a million people that would send you in one direction or another just to help you out. You had to do it all. You know, more time that goes on, the worse the internet gets. I know. It's, I know. You know, between the Googles and the book of phases oh and all this God, stuff. It's terrible. No, ah, it's, God, this stuff makes me crazy. I know. You got me all wound up and I got to relax. Yeah. All right. So uh, next week. Well, we, yeah, we didn't talk about next week. I mean, we got a guy, but it's, it's Memorial Day. Yeah, I really don't give a shit. I'll cook burgers here. Yeah, I know you don't give a <laughs> shit, but some some people do. Uh, well, I know you don't you don't care about anything because no. you live here. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, perfect. I know. I know. I wish I lived here sometimes. Huh? Come here with the doors open. Oh, guns by the door. Uh. I didn't mean the same rooms. <laughs> oh boy, sending pictures of some guy and a dog. <laughs> yeah, that wasn't that wasn't us. <laughs> Thank God. All right. Well, I mean, we'll we'll talk about it. We'll keep everybody informed when we're when we're going to get back on. Probably yeah. next week. Yeah, well, I mean, it, look, if you got something you got to do on Monday, forget I do, it. I do not. I don't think Tad's got any big plans. Tad? So. Food, that's about it. All right. Oh, boy. Well, we'll be here probably on Monday. If anything changes, we'll let you know. Yep. All right. See you guys next time. Yep. All right, do you want to say anything unofficial off the air? No. All right, you don't want to? No. All right. <laughs> <laughs> There'll be time for that. Yeah. We, could, that, we, we we might need a show that we don't have a guest to talk about it. Yeah, well, thanks, everybody. Um, I We all appreciate listening. I hope you enjoyed it because, to me, it was a great privilege to talk to that man. Oh, yeah. He is the guy uh, when, when it comes to a lot of things. And, you know, he, he pointed out to me that he's 78 and – that that says so much to me because it's not a damn young for it well not only that i mean the the thought process and where he came from there was you know no data locking no this yeah. no that that the, the guy has really got a got got a lot to offer yeah. so we'll we'll get him back we promise no doubt all right see you guys later